Hey, good morning. I'm Robert Trawick. We want to welcome our worldwide audience to Bedford's Photo Expo Live today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Robert Trawick, and I'm here to kind of guide you through these amazing speakers we're going to have over the next two days. Now, if you're watching me live right now, you know this presentation is free. So take a few minutes and share this with all of your photography buddies out there worldwide. We have people tuning in from all over the world, uh, probably different time zones, different languages. So hopefully you guys can read my lips and understand the translations that we may or may not have at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> it's going to be fun. As you understand, it is uh, very early in the morning here in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I have not had enough coffee but I'm gonna do my best to get through this start and then you guys get to see my presentation. So again, free, I want you guys to share this online. We have two days of absolutely amazing speakers. We have prizes. If you guys are watching live, you're gonna see the codes pop up. It's gonna be great and we still have two, if you live in the Little Rock area, two photo walks. We have a sunrise photo walk tomorrow morning and we have an evening photo walk with Jeremy Smith. We call him here, The Great, is going to be doing one tomorrow afternoon. So I'm going to take this time real quick to introduce the president of Bedford Camera for some announcement. Austin, come on in. Thank you, Robert. Um, hello. My name is Austin Pittman, and I am the president of Bedford Camera and Video. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, for Photo Expo Live 2021. We're very excited. This is the first time we've really tried anything like this in Little Rock, and we're ready to go. Um, we have an online audience from all over the country and really all over the world for this. Um, significant international viewership. We've got people from California, Florida, all over the place. We're very excited to have you guys here. I wanted to do just a really brief introduction to our company for those of you that are not familiar with Bedford Camera. Um, we have been in business since 1974. We have seven uh, retail camera locations in Arkansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. Um, full line Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, Tamron, Sigma, all the big uh, vendors, we, we've, got all the, we've got everything. Um, starting today, we have huge sales in all seven of our locations. Um, so big, in fact, that we can't even advertise them or can't even talk about them. So if you're in one of our, uh, one of our markets, come into your local Bedfords, ask them what kind of sales we've got going on. There's all kinds of stuff. We've got reps in the different stores. Um, we have Sigma and Sony are in Oklahoma City today and tomorrow. We have Canon and Tamron in Tulsa, in our Tulsa, Oklahoma store. And here in Little Rock, we've got Nikon and our F-Stop rep. So come see these guys. If you have any questions about those, come see us for the great deals. If you're outside of our viewing area, we have a discount code set up on bedfords.com. So you can go to our website anytime between now and Sunday at midnight. There, if you type, you know, go in there, put everything in your cart that you want to do, and at checkout, type in Expo Live for a, a show special discount for the Expo Live. Um, thanks again for watching, we're very excited. We've got a ton of great speakers. Um, it's still, if you wanna sign up for one of the photo walks, we've still got room in both of those photo walks. You're welcome to, to sign up to those. Um, and, and we're ready to go. So I am going to introduce our first speaker of the morning, and it's actually also our MC, Robert Trawick, who you just heard from. Um, Robert has a long list of accomplishments, but still has to pay full price at local coffee shops. And actually, we just got him some coffee here and charged him for that as well. So, you know, no free coffee for Robert. Being called the most interesting photographer in Oklahoma, he loves sharing the knowledge along with a few tricks honed over a 30 plus year professional career. As a Westcott top pro, Robert is unique in his approach to flash photography and encourages others to embrace and explore this duality of exposure, blending ambient light with strobes. A self-professed time traveler, Robert has been active in the industry since 1980, receiving most of his formal training during a 20-year career as a United States Air Force photojournalist, and he is a currently a full-time photographer based in Oklahoma City. Robert happily shares life's beautiful Instagrams with inspirations in his life. A fabulously talented photographer wife, Terry, amazing daughters, Amy, Amber, Georgia, and Shannon. So without further ado, I welcome Robert Trawick. Woo, thank you so much, Austin, I appreciate that. I, I, I am so thankful that he read my bio word for word as I wrote it. 
<laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm so glad to be here this morning. I am a little nervous because I'm talking to people around the world on a camera, so I feel like I'm giving some kind of like news brief or something. So if I happen to like walk in or kind of like guide into some kind of news announcement as though like, you know, we're expanding, you know, markets or anything, don't worry, it's just me ad-libbing, so it's going to be great. So if you guys are looking at the screen right now, I do have a link down here at the bottom if you would like to download a PDF version of today's presentation. So you guys can follow along and maybe use those as references in the future, you can do so right there. During the presentation, if you want to go back, send me an email, just go ahead and do something on the chat. We have Sean over there following our chat for our live viewers, and I'm happy to share that link with you right there. So you guys can download that PDF and follow along. So let's go ahead and get into light tails. And... Um, Okay, that's coming up really slow. Could be, I have an old computer, but it's gonna work just fine. All right, so I want you guys to love your light more. It's gonna be beautiful. So of course, so many people out there worldwide may not know Robert Trawick, so let me tell you a little bit about me and where I come from. So I was born in Spain, raised in North Carolina, joined the service and did 20 years as a photojournalist, and I love photography. If you spend five minutes with me anytime, you'll figure out that's the only thing I really talk about is coffee and photography. Both go hand in hand to drive my passion. So I've been uh, recently selected as a Westcott Top Pro. Probably not so much because of my lighting skills, but more because I'm a mouthpiece that talks loud and I ask for things. And uh, they've been very kind in trying to support my lighting equipment habit, I guess. So I also spent a lot of time in the military, like I mentioned before, and that's where I got a lot of my training in photography. I did start on film, processing film, and shooting that, so the transition to digital was a lot easier for me than most people, and I really enjoyed it. But we're gonna get into the meat of the program, and that's why you guys are here. If you ever send me a question, you can drop me an email, you can text me, you can hit me up on Facebook. I will answer all questions, but please understand, as a full-time photographer, I could go several days without checking social media or my email because I'm busy involved in different shoots, but I will answer any questions you have. And of course, while we have the presentation, feel free to drop those questions in the chat. Sean will pass those to me at the end of the show, and I'll get those answered to you. All right, so... I want to start off with a quote to kind of set the tone of what this program is going to be. And it's going to be about light. And honestly, when I was given my um, description of the class to John Rose about what I wanted to talk about, because light to me is key to everything photographic. If I knew that Joel Grimes was going to be one of the presenters, the keynote speaker tonight is Joel Grimes, I think I probably would have chose a different subject, like, you know, how to love your camera more because Joel Grimes knows a lot about lighting, but this could scratch some of the basics of light and get you prepared for his program this afternoon that I hope you all turn, uh, tune in for. So light makes photography, embrace it, admire it, love it, and above all, know light. Know it for all your worth, and you will know the key to photography. So that was said by George Eastman. He's the entrepreneur that founded Kodak Company. So a lot of my programs that start about light, this quote is very well done in explaining and expressing the value of light in photography. If you can understand the light better, it is more important than understand how your camera is going to capture the light, even though all those things go hand in hand. Um, I kind of bring it around sometimes like a race car driver doesn't need to know how the engine runs or what the tire stickiness is on the racetrack, he just needs to drive the car. But if he can understand why the engine does different things or why different tires grip the track better, then he can be a better driver. So that's what I wanna po pose to the audience today is loving your light is all about understanding it and that's the key to success. So let's define light. What exactly is light? Because there's a lot of different ways out there we can explain it. On the most basic part, light is something that makes things visible. Now, can we take a photograph in a completely black room? Anybody? Anybody? 
Well, we can take a photograph in a completely dark room, and the resulting photograph would be black. So you can take a photograph with no light, but it's not going to tell any story. Unless you're trying to take a photograph of a black sheep at night, and it's just going to be a big black canvas hanging in an art gallery, and people are going to walk around thinking they really enjoy what you did. So you can take a photograph without light, but it's not going to have the story. So the fine and light, it's something that makes things visible or affords illumination. So that is what we're working with. When we afford the illumination and when we have things come forward and we make them visible to the human eye and to our cameras, that's when photography really stakes, takes hold. Now we're going to talk about the light types. So there's basically two light types that exist in our world. We have the constant and we have the flash. Now we have most of the photographers that, uh, let's say, do wildlife photography, they do natural light photography, light that's already available in nature. They're not carrying around studio lights to go photograph lions in the Serengeti. They're dealing with the ambient or the constant light that's already there. And the ambient or constant lights could be the sun, a light bulb, an LED flashlight, flames, lava. Lava's a great uh, constant light source or even an arc light that they would use for movie projectors back in the day at the sound stage. And then we had the flash and the strobe. Now the flash and the strobe is a different, it still affords illumination, it still lights the subject, but it does it in a very quick burst, which is very hard for us to see with our eyes. So you have strobe, studio light units, and you have disco ball strobes. I'm not sure how many of you people grew up in the disco age, I did spend a little time listening to the Bee Gees when I was younger, and uh, maybe going to a discotheque occasionally, I was always mesmerized dancing with my partner and just kind of having that stop motion look when you're dancing because the strobes flashing on the disco ball, that's very much along the same lines as using flash in photography. Here is one of your secrets that I want you to understand and think about. The only difference between the constant light and your strobe lights are time. That is the absolutely only difference. We can go outside and look at a sunlit portrait, landscape, or any type of photography that's using the sun as its illumination, and we can actually see things happen with our eyes because the light source is what we would consider constant. The light source is always there. If we use a incandescent bulb, an LED bulb, anything like that, we can actually see it with our eyes, so we call it constant light. The flash gives all its power in an immediate burst, but both of these lights have the exact same characteristics. There's no difference between sunlight and a studio flash. They're the same light in the sense that they all have to adhere to five characteristics. And if you can understand those characteristics, it'll make it easier for you to control the light, to bend it to your will, because that's what we do as photographers. We bend light and make an image. So the only difference is time. If we were able to take constant light and speed it up, it would be like a flash. If we were able to take flash and slow it down, then it would look like constant light. That's why most people are afraid of flash is because we can't see it. We can only capture it and then review it in our camera. But the only difference is light. Both light sources had the exact same characteristics and understanding that is the key to loving your light better. So let's just go ahead and jump into that. Let's talk about the characteristics of light. Whether you're using strobe or using constant, using the LED or even a chicken light. I'm not sure if you guys ever started with that, you know, a little heat type lamp with a little 100 watt bulb in there, clamped to a side of a, a table. That's how we started a long time ago. So the five characteristics are intensity, color, direction, distance, and size. Every light source has these characteristics. Burn that into your brain, download my PDF, print it out, hold it, learn it, because if you learn light better, you'll be able to shoot better and it will be more consistent. So let's go over those again. We have intensity, color, direction, distance, and size. 
Let's break those down so you can understand what each of them do, slightly different, and how you can control that in your photography. So the very first one is intensity. Every light source has a power. It's either more intense or less intense, and that's all we're concentrating on is the intensity of the light. Have you ever taken a dark photo on a bright sunny day? I, I, I'm gonna admit I have, I've left the lens cap on before, and the photo comes out very dark. But you could also change your camera settings with maybe a very low ISO, a high shutter speed, and a very closed down aperture to where the daylight scene seems very dark. So every single light source has a certain intensity. But as photographers, we have controls in our camera to either capture more or less of that intensity through time. If I allow the camera to stay open longer, the intensity doesn't increase of the light, but the exposure in the camera does. At the same time, the intensity of the light may not change, but I could make the shutter speed so fast that I only capture a portion of that intensity. So intensity is one of the first things that you wanna look at when you are getting ready for your photo. It's one of the biggest things of your exposure, is how much light am I going to allow into the camera to get the story that I want in the image that I'm capturing. So it's just the amount of light on the scene or a subject. And I wanna point out, this is a great shot of, uh, of Dalen. It's a senior photo. She was an equestrian writer. And uh, as we get on with the story, you're gonna to get to the meat of this at the very end. If you were last night at our photo walk, I had everybody repeat it, and you're gonna repeat it at the very end of this program because it's gonna be awesome. But I want you to look at the direction of the light that's coming from here. It's not on her face. She's actually backlit. Back you can kind of see the outline right here of the horse. All right, Dalen's hair's all lit up. But man, her face is really lit up as well. I wonder how that's possible. And I'm gonna tell you guys how to do it and it's not that hard. So intensity is the amount of light that's falling on, on a subject or a scene, but in your camera, you have the control to make it lighter or darker by how much the light you allow to come in. So let's go to the next one is color. Every single light source, including reflections, which I would consider to be a secondary light source, even though it's just bounced light, has a color. Now, again, I started back in the film days, so when we shot film, we would pick a daylight or a tungsten balanced film and if we had to do any color correcting, they had to be screwed in filters in the front of the lens. And uh, if you were fortunate enough to have a good budget, when I was in the military, I did have a fairly nice budget. We had a color spectrometer where we would go around and see what the color temperature is of the lights. And we had a chart for the filters that we'd screw into the front so we could get a clean white balance. Now with digital, we can dial those white balances in from one image to the next because all we're doing is converting the algorithm of what the camera's capturing and how we're shifting the color information when it's recorded. So now you have an availability of changing your white balance from image to image or not even choosing the correct white balance. Color in your image is a very powerful communicator. Let me give you a perfect example. Um, I love animals. I have uh, four beautiful, well, I was gonna say daughters, but it's actually four beautiful puppies that I treat as my daughters. And if you've ever driven up and down a highway, the uh, pet shelters many times do not show you a happy photo of a pet in a pet shelter and they'll actually use green colors or blue tones, which are kind of a sadder tone, to make you emotionally compelled to do something about that. The same thing in horror flicks. If you like horror flicks, green. Green is not a color of light that is normally found in nature, so it actually hits us somewhere emotionally as we're watching that horror flick, and when they use those green filters of fluorescent in a hospital, 
we know something's gonna happen bad because that's unusual, it's unnatural. So it kind of gets us agitated right before they scare us. So color is a very powerful element in your photography on how you tell the story. And by using the white balance in your camera, it's very easy to adjust it. But the key here is that every single light source, including reflections, has its own color. And you can either adjust your camera to record that color neutrally, white balance, meaning to make things white, not blue, green, or whatever, or you can modify your white balance to either make the image warmer or cooler so that you're telling a different story. For example, when I shoot people outside in Oklahoma, I'm based in Oklahoma City, most of the seniors that I shoot probably have not seen the light of day in several years, and their skin is quite pale. Nothing wrong, not judging. All I do if I'm shooting in daylight is I will switch my white balance to cloudy, and I'll bring in some warmer tones into their skin tones, which of course in Capture One, I could dial down later on and make it a little bit not so unnatural. But by dialing in and warming up the image with my white balance settings, I can get a nicer image. I've had to tell, turn the camera to the mother because she wants to be involved. She's not looking at a very pale senior, but she's seeing skin tones that are full of life. So color is an excellent way for you to communicate the story in your image and remember, every single light source, including reflections, has color and color tone in it. And you have to make the decision on how you're going to record those color tones. All right, the next one is direction. I know that this seems very simple and everybody's like, well, yeah, light's got direction. It comes from the left, comes from the right, comes from above, comes from below. This is probably the least used element of lighting to be able to tell a story. Direction is going to reveal dimensions and texture in your image. That's one of the reasons that we tell photographers, especially when they're beginning, that on-camera flash is not flattering because being that it's on the same plane as the lens, the light hits like a pancake, like right in the face, and it doesn't give us any dimensionality of the image. Remember that in photography, we're using a two-dimension capture device. We don't have depth. So we have width and height, but we're taking a photograph of something that's three-dimensional, and we want the viewer to look at it and be able to go into the photograph and read the story. So we want to use light and shadow to be able to mimic the depth that's in the image and show textures and reveal dimension. So down at the very bottom, you'll see one of my little keynotes, which is light reveals, shadows define. You need to have shadows in your image because that will give the viewer that wasn't there an idea of the depth, the shape, the roundness of the image. So this is a, a image that we did in a studio for a gym website. And yeah, I could have just sit here and flat lit him all day long, but he has such great muscle structure that we decided to light him from the side. And that was gonna give us something a little bit more dramatic and bring your eye right to his face and let the other side kind of go into darkness. So use that direction of the light to be able to tell your story better. All right, so it sets the mood. So use that direction. This is one of your best ways to create interesting stories in your images. So the next one is distance. So distance and the next, because remember there's five. So distance and size, I like to call the kissing cousins. This is probably one of the least understood characteristics of lighting. And again, if you can get this, your lighting is just gonna shoot through the roof. So distance affects the quality of light. Characteristics are how light behaves. Quality of light, we refer to soft or hard. And I want you guys to get that out of your head. All right, let's, I want you guys to elevate your thought process on your lighting. 
There's no such thing as a hard light or a soft light. It's all relative. There are lights that are softer and there's lights that are harder. And we can adjust that quality of light based on the distance of the light to the subject. Now let's try and wrap that around a little bit. Our eyes are like a camera, but they're in automatic mode. So many times when we take the light and move it further away from a subject, we feel the light gets softer when in fact it's actually getting harder, but the intensity is dropping and our eyes, the aperture of our eyes open up so we can actually see more details in the shadow and we think the light is softer when in fact it's harder. Use your camera to take photographs so you can prove this theory and just take an image of a model, let's say five feet away with your camera, back the light up 20 feet and take a shot and then look at the difference. And when we're talking about basically your harder light or your softer light, I'm referring more to the contrast between the highlighted lit side and your shadow side. So if there's a very defined line between where the light hits and the shadow area, that would be considered a harder light. If the transition is very smooth, where you have light here and it kind of gradiates very gently into a darker shadow on the side, then that would be a softer light. But this directly affects the quality of light, harder or softer, and it's very important to understand the inverse square law of light, and we're gonna talk about it later, and I'm gonna make it so simple that anybody can understand it. And if you can understand light and the inverse square law of light, I guarantee you your photography is going to soar because most people will not take the time to do this. They're only gonna spend time looking at constant light and capturing the lights that's there. Nothing wrong with that. I think that's great. But if you live in different cities where, let's say the weather doesn't cooperate, or maybe you have a senior session planned for nine o'clock in the morning and it's really, really cloudy, you may not get the images that you want because the light isn't there. And then what do you do? Cancel your shoot and reschedule it for a sunny day? Or do you bring some Westcott lights out and make the light magic for you and your subject? That's what I prefer to do. You can choose your own path. So the other kiss, kissing cousin of distance is size. Now this is one that a lot of photographers really, really go into. The bigger the light source, the softer the light is completely true. But that doesn't mean that a large light source is the right light source for the story that you are telling. This is where you're going to have to make some magic happen between the size of the light and the distance of the light related to the subject. So let's take size, for example. The sun is so much larger than the earth. I mean, it's gigantic, right? It's big, but it's so far away that on a brightly lit day, I can take my hand and I can actually cover the sun. So is that light, because it's so large, a soft light source? Remember size and distance being kissing cousins? It's very big in size, but it's so far away that the size has been optically diminished because of the distance, and then the sun became a much smaller light source, therefore it became a harder light. Now, that same scene where we have the sun up above and a layer of clouds move in, and the sun is shining through the clouds just like the white fabric, the fusion fabric on an octobox for West, Westcott, it makes the light scatter and it makes it a larger light source. If I'm outside on a cloudy day, I, I can't take my hand and cover up all the clouds in the light source like I could if the sun was by itself. Larger light source, softer light. Size, distant, or kissing cousins, but relative to your subject. So this shot right here is actually my nephew, Nathan. Really good looking guy, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, wow great football player, works out all the time. We wanted to do this shot in the stadium with his uh, jersey on. 
And this light is actually an Octobox. So it's a very small Octobox. Um, it's an Octobox medium from Westcott. And when we did this shot, obviously with the wide angle, I really couldn't have the, the, in, the light very close to him because it would be in the shot. So we had to back that out of camera frame, which made the light smaller relative to him. However, I really feel that the light being a little bit smaller really fit the mood of what we were going in since I was kind of like front light him with the sunset going behind. Now, a lot of you folks know that I love using Luminar to post-process some of my images because the skies in Oklahoma can be really washed out. This is not a Luminar sky. This is actual sky that we got from Bowling Green. So I was pretty happy with it. So size and distance when you're selecting your light for your subject can tell you if you're going to have a hard transition between your highlight and shadow or a soft transition between your highlight and shadow. Harder light or softer light. But don't be afraid to use light that isn't modified. It's a bare bulb in a reflector like on the FJ200s that I use because sometimes that harder punch light especially when shooting fashion, it's a great, powerful look and it really makes the clothes sparkle. Where selecting a larger light source may not give that sheen to different quality of uh, fabric that your model is using. So size and distance, kissing cousins, and you can modify these to make the light harder or softer. So I hope you guys are following along with me so far because we're about halfway through Wow, have I been talking for like 20 minutes? Wow, we're gonna run through this quick. It's gonna be amazing. So this is the big takeaway for this part of the presentation. The larger the source, the softer the quality of light relative to the subject. And that is the biggest key. If I have a, let's say the smallest Octobox that Westcott makes, and I put it very close to someone's face, Relative to the subject, that box is large. But as I pull that box away, it becomes smaller and it changes the quality of light. Doesn't change anything else, but the quality of light. I'm changing the distance that's modifying the quality and the distance in size optically change the quality to make it harder. All right, so let's get into something a little bit more technical but I'm gonna try and make it as simple as possible to everybody to understand. Let me get a quick sip of my coffee because I'm getting really dry. Wow, that's, that's not bad coffee, that's really good. So let's talk about the inverse square law of light. You guys have heard it. Many people are afraid of it. You don't understand it, so I'm just gonna keep on going through my life the way it is. But if you can grasp this very simple idea it will really help your storytelling in your photos. So the inverse square law is very simple. I'm not gonna get into the whole formula. If you want me to go into it, I can do a separate video for everyone, but there's plenty of great resources out there. Uh, I'm sure Joe Edelman, which will be presenting tomorrow, could explain this extremely eloquently, but I'm gonna make it simple as possible, and this is the way I understand it. So as light travels away from the subject, the intensity drops off at a calculated rate. That's it. That's very, everybody knows that. If I have a flashlight or a flash, the further away I take my subject, well, the darker it gets. If I don't change up then the intensity of the light, the further away you get from the light, the darker it gets. But it happens at a calculated rate. And that is important for us. You don't have to know math, even though knowing math and photography is the basis for all kinds of good things. You don't have to do it because we can actually do this through practical application. When you double the distance between the light source and the subject, you're gonna lose two lights, two stops of intensity because the light has a spread twice as far wide and twice as far high. So it's basically a spread of four X so you cut down two stops of light. Again, I want you to remember the simple part. The simple part is the subject gets further away from the light, it gets darker. Are you guys with me on that, right? Leave comments below if you can't understand that principle. 
when you get further away from the light, the subject exposure is darker. Okay, think of it like a tunnel effect. The further away you get from the ent entrance, the darker it is and it's harder for you to see because light travels and loses power through distance. But it happens at a calculated rate and that's advantageous for us. So let's think about this for a second. I want you guys to imagine your head, you're doing a portrait in the studio. If you feel like you want to close your eyes, it's good. I really can't see you. So if you want to close your eyes, you're drinking your nice warm cappuccino, coffee. Uh, I know a lot of you guys drink tea. That's totally okay if you're in the UK. I, I like tea as well. You're doing a shot inside of a studio. You have a single light source and you bring it close to the subject because the larger the light source, the softer the light. So if I bring the light source closer, reduce my distance by optically making my light appear larger than the subject, I have soft light. That's simple. You can do this right now at home and practice it. Works like a champ. But what happens to the inverse square law of light in that application? So if you are five feet away, your light is five feet from your subject. Beyond your subject, five feet, so basically the light is here beside the camera, subject's five feet away, and at the 10 foot mark, so five foot behind the subject, your light has dropped off two stops of light. It gets darker. By the time we double that and we're at 20 feet, it's really not getting any light that's gonna come into the camera because now you're four stops underexposed from your base on the subject. So as you bring the light in closer to get softer light, the travel of the light, and I'm just gonna call it the light depth. You guys have heard of depth of field. This is depth of light. So as you bring it closer, your light fall off is faster. This is great, it's not a bad thing. It's just another tool in your toolbox. So if I have a background that I don't really want to include or it might be too busy for a subject, then I will take that light and bring it in really close to the subject just outside a camera angle, knowing that light is not gonna light the background behind them. And I can make that background go darker or even drop another, like an FJ80 in the background and do a little backlight on the subject. That way I can reduce, that the background hasn't changed, but because of the settings of the camera, I've made the background darker in relation to the light intensity that I'm throwing on the subject with the depth of light using the inverse square law of light. Same thing happens if I need to reverse it. When shooting weddings and doing large groups of weddings, so many people ask me, why is my light 20 or 30 feet away from my group photo? Well, let's reverse the inverse square law of light so you can understand that. You guys understand if I bring the light source closer to make it softer, the light fall off or the light depth is very short. If I have five rows of people in a group shot and I bring my light 10 feet from the front row, by the time it hits 20 feet, it's two stops darker. What if my light is 20 feet away from the front row? then I'm not losing two stops of light until it's 40 feet away from my light source. So I can make sure that each line, each row that is in a large group shot or even a corporate shot have very similar light intensity by backing the light up, knowing that my depth of light will be greater. If you still don't completely understand, hit me a message in the comments and I'll try and pitch it to you another way, but understanding the light placement, and, and again, the light placement has to do on the distance between the light and the subject. It doesn't have to do with the size of the light. We're just talking about the depth of the light if the same modifier was used, all right? So we double the distance between the light source and the subject, and you lose two stops of light, and the spread is 4x. So here is a little demonstration on how 
this works. So there's a little app out there that Joe Edelman turned me on to, and I believe it's called Set a Light. In Set a Light, you can practice studio lighting in your home on your computer without even grabbing your equipment out. At least you can make mock-ups and see how different light modifiers, uh, distances are going to affect the photo. So if we look in this very first one, the background is 15 feet away and the subject is 10 feet away. This is our subject and I've added two other models. So she's 10 feet from the background. This one is about, I think she's five feet from the background and this one is on the background. So she's maybe like about six inches from the background itself. And what we did is we took the main light, single light, didn't raise it, didn't reduce it, just took the single light and we backed it up different distances. Now, is it gonna make the light darker? Absolutely. So as we backed it up, we increased the power so our exposure would be very similar. So if you look at this first one on how the light fall off is, look at the shadows under her chin, but they're soft shadows because the light is close and therefore it's a softer light. But notice how the two models in the back, one that's only five feet behind this first one, are obviously much darker. That is because the inverse square law of light and the light depth, it drops off very quickly. Because if the light is 10 feet from the subject at 20 feet, I lose two stops of light. Now we're backing the light up because I want to be able to get enough light on all three subjects even though they're in different planes of focus. So then I back the light up to 20 feet. So now we're getting a little bit more light on our models in the back. And if you look at the transition shadow under her chin, the shadow is becoming harder. There's not as much transition because when I move the light back, the quality of light became harder because of the two things. Remember the kissing cousins? I'm further back because of distance, which optically makes the same modifier appear optically smaller relative to the subject. Then we come over here and go back to 20 feet. So here's, oh, I'm sorry, this one's 15 feet. So yeah, 10, 15, 20. So here's 20 feet. And here's 30 feet. By the time we get 30 feet away, I'm not gonna lose my two stops of light until there's an object that's 60 feet away from the flash. So in this image right here, all three girls have almost identical intensity of exposure. Now they're not on the same plane, but they all had the same intensity of exposure. So group photos, large group photos, back your light up to create that depth of light so that all of your rows have the same light intensity so that the back row, people standing in the very back don't go very dark and you wind up having to boost the shadows and capture one to try and bring back some of that detail. That is the basics of the inverse square law of light. Bring the light closer to the subject, light fall off is quicker, take the light back away from the subject, and the light depth is increased. Light quality is gonna change, but your light depth is gonna change as well, and you can use that to your advantage. So by backing the light up, you'll notice I'm also throwing more light on the background, and that background is remaining gray where on the very first one where the light is very close, I've got a hot spot on the background, a little bit of a hot spot, and it fades off into a very dark gray. So when doing headshots, you don't have to use a separate light for your background if you can invoke the inverse square law of light and change the position of the background to the subject relative to the light. You can change the density of your background and you can find the perfect shade of gray either using a white background or a white background. It's pretty simple. So hopefully that explains the inverse square law of light and it will make you guys better photographers. We're almost done, so hold on to that coffee and don't fall asleep on me yet. Okay, so let's talk about modifiers. I'm a Westcott Pro, I really believe in the products. I'm not sure if you guys are aware that Westcott did not start off 
by doing photography equipment. They're an umbrella manufacturer. And I thought to myself, umbrellas, I mean, I imagine in the 1800s, umbrellas was something that everybody used. I mean, when was the last time you popped an umbrella out to go anywhere unless you're a golfer? Oh, by the way, did I tell you they invented the golf umbrella? I probably should have, probably should have lived with that. But then when you start to look at their modifiers and their products, they're definitely built with the long history and tradition of umbrella makers that make them amazing. My seven foot umbre umbrella that I got from Westcott that everyone made fun of me on Instagram for has got the amazing frame and it's got fiberglass poles in it. I think you guys are gonna need to go try it out because I love it. So the modifiers, all they do is modify your original source. So if you have a small, like the FJ200, it's about that big of a head. Now it has a very big spread, has a frosted globe on the front, so it really has a good light spread to it. But if I take that light and I put it inside of an Octobox M, which is one of my favorites, I've modified the light and I have changed the characteristics. I have made the light larger. I've changed the shape by adding the modifier. And that's the only thing modifiers do. If you're as old as I am, you probably remember the days of shooting with a Vivitar 283 and a milk jug as a modifier. And if you haven't seen that, go hit YouTube. There's some old guys still posting that stuff on there. If you don't wanna use the milk jug, just come see me. We'll talk about Westcott all day long. So that's the only thing that a modifier does that changes the source to modify one or more of the characteristics of that light. So let's talk about favorite ones. That's my daughter, Shannon, by the way, isn't she a looker? So here's the must have ones that I recommend to all photographers starting out. Even if you don't like using a strobe outdoors or studio, or whatever, and you just wanna use natural light, some of these can definitely help. The very first one is a reflector, gels, an umbrella, Octobox, and an off-camera flash makes an amazing modifier, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So the very first one is a reflector. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Do you guys know that like, even a white piece of paper can be a reflector? You know, now this piece of paper, if you bought it at Staples, is probably a penny, but if you go into a camera store and it has Robert's name on it, and it says professional photo paper reflector, it'll be a dollar ten. But if you look right here at my chin, if I take this reflector and go down here, it reflects the light and comes up and it basically changes the shadow, okay? So it modifies the light a little bit by changing the contrast. Any light source hitting reflector can never be as bright as the light it's hitting. So what does the reflector really modify? It modifies the intensity. So if you have a very bright light, you don't have to have the bright light hitting the subject. You can point it away from the subject and use a reflector to bounce that light into the subject so it reduces the intensity. It can change direction, color, and size. Because you've seen some of those five-in-ones that have the zebra pattern on it. They have a little bit of gold, silver, and some white and a zebra pattern. So that can change and modify the color. Really great for doing bikini models on a bright sunny day where you wanna add that little gold tone into it, we have gold tone reflectors. That's where that comes from. When you use that reflector, it's only hitting the subject, making the subject golden. It's not hitting anything else like the background and making it golden because the reflector can't do that. So the reflector, you should always have one. I keep three reflectors in my car just about all the time because I hate taking things in and out of the car all the time that I'm gonna use almost daily. So the next one, gels. Now this is, uh, this is actually a pretty simple one. Gels do not have to be photographic quality, like something you're gonna put on top of your lens. You could use Tupperware containers that are red and green that they sell through the Christmas holidays. You could take that and put it over your flash. Now, word of caution, if you buy it cheap, it will melt. That will totally happen. I may or may not have done that myself, and after three or four shots from the uh, FJ 400s, I may or may not have melted two or three Tupperware dishes. So if you can go to your local store, you can buy heat resistant Rock Roscoe gels that you can tape over any light and actually modify that. 
This is a great shot. I love the thinking man. We actually did this at Photo Expo in Memphis um, two years ago. And all I did to modify and change the story dynamic of the image is to add a blue gel to one side of his face with a different light source. And that can change how the story is told to the viewer. It's very inexpensive. It doesn't take up a lot of light, a lot of weight or space in your bag. And there's all kinds of different companies that make gels. Go check out the ones from Roscoe. Um, Westcott has gels that perfectly fit in all of their modifiers, uh, not modifiers, their lights. And you guys can get to gelling right away. It's a very easy way to add a different storyline to the images that you're capturing. And of course, it just modifies color. So the next one is umbrellas. Don't laugh. Don't laugh at umbrellas because they are like your shotgun of light. And I'm telling you right now, when the zombie apocalypse comes, you might want to have an AR-15. I'll take a shotgun so I have a wide berth of hitting lots of stuff without having to aim. And that's what an umbrella does. Even today, if you see me shooting events, I will use umbrella because the umbrella spreads the light in such a way that I have a wide area that my subjects can move in without changing the intensity of the light, but it gives me a great depth of light and a great spread of light. So with two umbrellas and a background, a 10 by 20 background, I can bring those back far enough. The light is going to get diffused through the umbrella. It's gonna create a large area where my models or my subjects at an event can be within a three to four foot area and I don't have to change the setting on my camera. Never, ever be afraid of starting out with an umbrella. In fact, that's what I recommend anybody starting out with light. Soft boxes are great. Hard boxes are fantastic. Umbrellas are a fantastic way to start because they're very, very forgiven. All right. You don't have to watch that placement of an umbrella to be able to get a good exposure of a subject like you would a soft box or a beauty dish or even a strip box. Those have to be placed pretty precisely. Otherwise, you will miss the light intensity and you'll be operating inside somewhere at the edge that you're your luma sides and we can talk about it another day this modifies intensity inside by taking the umbrella and putting on the fj 400 i've made the light appear to be much larger than the bare bulb if i make the light appear larger what have i done i've softened the light quality so size and the intensity because it's going to reduce the output or the exposure because I'm having to spread the light over such a large area, the intensity of exposure will go down. So whenever you put an umbrella on, you'll probably have to modify your camera settings, probably three stops, say two stops to three stops, depending on how efficient the umbrella is. All right, so now we're gonna go into the Octobox. This is probably one of the most popular modifiers out there, the Octobox. Why do we use an Octobox over a rectangle one? It's just about the catch lights. Octobox is round, simulates the shape of the sun, so I like to use that outside. And then our square and rectangular boxes, I prefer to use those indoors because it simulates window light coming from a square window or a rectangular window. So that's how we're doing the shape. We're not choosing one or the other because the light quality is better. We're doing it for the reflection of the eye. And the Octobox, since I shoot a lot outside, is a great cho choice for that because I get a nice like round catch light that looks like the sun. Obviously, it modifies the size and intensity, which I should have added on there, but the biggest one is size. We're using these modifiers to make the light source appear to be larger as well as guide the direction of the light. So go check out the Octobox M with the rapid mount from Westcott. It's my favorite one, you'll love that one. Okay, off camera flash. Now why did I include this into the modifier? Well, because direction and size are the kissing cousins that do the light quality. This shot was done at a wedding about, uh, oh, it's been, a, it's been a while ago, but it's one of my favorite images. And let me tell you what happened. 
So we went to a bar after the wedding, okay, after the wedding, and this is the bride, and she is sitting there with a martini glass while her brand new husband is talking to some friends outside of the frame. My partner had my flash that I'm set up on a trigger, and I was actually shooting her, and I didn't know if the light would reach. I didn't know if it would actually give me a good exposure or if it was just gonna light up everything in the room. But because of how far away it was, it was a very small point of light because it was a little small speed light. And I think it made an incredible story of her waiting with the martini for her new husband to arrive from talking to his friends. And I absolutely love this shot. So I really include an off-camera flash system that you can place in different directions so you can change the direction and size of the light source to capture what you want. And this is a perfect one. The, the Westcott has got a great system. There's a lot of other systems out there. If you're unsure of what's available, the best thing to do is to stop in any of our stores this weekend and be able to talk to any of the experts behind the counter on your lighting needs. And I'm not sure if it was mentioned or not so I'm gonna do this live, just so you guys know. I heard a rumor that if you come in to the Little Rock store, they are gonna pay the sales tax for you this weekend. And I don't know about you, if you've seen the price tag of some of the equipment that I buy, if they buy, if they buy the sales tax, I, I can buy more equipment and not have to worry about the sales tax. So it'd be pretty awesome. Stop by any store and ask them if Robert is speaking the truth online. So the off-camera flash system can definitely be a great way of modifying your light. Hold on guys, don't stop, we're almost done, but we're, we're running in the middle. Robert's going as fast as I can, they may have to slow down my voice. All right, so now we're gonna talk about flambient. Flambient is a great term that mixes flash and ambient because when you're shooting flambient, basically what we have is two exposures. When you're shooting with constant light source, your controls are ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. That's, that's what you got. Any of those three things can modify the exposure of the image. But when you're shooting with flash, it's ISO, aperture, flash duration of power. Shutter speed doesn't come into that equation. The shutter just has to be open when the flash fires. But the shutter itself doesn't change the exposure of the flash. It just has to be open. Then the flash burst and the shutter can close. So the shutter is your key to flambient. By changing your shutter, you're modifying the background of your exposure while the flash is hitting your subject. So if you look at how I have it here, you guys can go download this PDF. So basically, your ambient and your subject, which is your flash, are two exposures when you're doing flambient. So if you're shooting flambient exposures and it looks like it's blurry, it's probably not blurry, it's probably a registration problem where there was a lot of motion and your flash exposure and your ambient exposure overlaid, but they were off. You've seen that happen in newspapers when the, app, the registration is off and the cartoons have extra colors and it's not very clear. Same thing happens in photography. So make sure you have a stop to a stop and a half difference between your exposure for your background and your exposure for your subject with flash when you're doing flambient and you should be fine. If you have any questions, hit me up on the chat. I'll be sure to check that in later on. Sean's gonna pitch me those questions at the end or you can always hit me up on my website and I will be able to answer that for you. All right, so this is the process. This is what I want you guys to repeat out there in your house. Nobody's around, nobody's gonna judge you. Set the base, light the face. Come on, say it with me again. If you guys say it really loud, I'll hear it all over the world. It'll be like that uh, Coca-Cola thing where we are the world with the Coca-Cola. Same thing. Set the base, light the face. One more time. Set the base, light the face. Very simple. We did this last night, the photo walk, and I had people telling me, oh my God, I've never heard that before. I did not invent this. I am a bread and butter photographer. I'm like that squirrel, that blind squirrel that can find a nut every once in a while. I'm not that great. Wait till you see Joe Edelman and Joel Grimes. 
Those guys are amazing. I'm just here because I'm very inexpensive and I love to talk. That's why Bedford hires me all the time. So basically, after you set the base exposure of your background, your ambient exposure, don't change your camera settings. People will bring in a light to light the subject. Oh, it's too dark. And they'll go and change their camera settings and then you have to repeat all over again. Set the base and then light the face. When you set the base, you're setting your base exposure and then you're lighting the face with the flash. Once you set the base, it's set. Don't change the camera settings for that shot. Take your light, move it in closer, further away, change the direction, increase the intensity, gel it, remember all the five characteristics that modify the quality of light, any of those only to the light source because all I'm doing is modifying the light on the face after I've set my base. So let's just see some quick examples and we'll wrap this show up. So you can see on the left is gonna be set the base. So this is a fashion shoot I did at the Myriad Gardens in Oklahoma City. This is our model Ayla, styled by Christian, which is my fashion stylist. Had it all styled up. I did my base exposure on my Fuji. That's what I come up with. Now I could have taken that image on set the base, could have brought it into Photoshop, I could have boosted my shadows and played around. But whenever you boost the shadows, you're gonna introduce a lot more noise into the image because it's underexposed. I have a beautiful Westcott light. I think you should own one as well because all I had to do is drop that thing down, turn it on, set to the power that I needed. I checked the exposure with my Psychonic light meter and bam, light the face. Now I filled it in. I actually brought in some more detail to all the leaves around and there, there you go. And if you're in the UK, I do know that term, bam, Bob's your uncle. Not sure where that comes from, but I always find it funny. So let's do one more. Set the base, light the face. If you look at the background, I set my Fuji X-T3 to expose the background the way I wanted. I didn't want it to be very dark. I didn't want it to be overexposed. I wanted to see that there's some color back there and it's a graffiti wall that's very famous in Oklahoma City. Okay, if you have a chance to go, it's called the Plaza Walls and they redo these, um, artwork, street art, uh, every couple of months. So I set my exposure, I set my base, my ambient exposure for the background. Obviously, if you look at the left side image, she's dark because that light is hitting the background, it's not hitting her, she's in shade. Then all I have to do is bring in my Westcott light with a modifier, boom, light the face. Set the base, light the face. Very easy. One of our great senior shots that we did all right, we're not done yet. We're almost there. We're in the final stretch. This is OKT. She is a fabulous person and she does almost anything for her t-shirt designs. I was helping Jamie Cobb from rentphotoville.com and this is a classic example. We're in shade. Now I could have overexposed the image and made the background blow out, but I wanted that stuff in the back to go with the shopping cart. If I would have overexposed to expose her properly, the background would have been completely blown out and I would have lost the sense of location. So all I did was set the base, make sure it's a little bit darker in my Fuji camera, bring in my Westcott and bam, hit it with the light and light the face and her great heels and the t-shirt and the shopping cart. Cause where else can you do a shopping cart shoot except for in Oklahoma City downtown? All right, so I want you guys to go out there and uh, thank my partners, Bedford Camera, Psychonic Light Meter, Westcott, and Fujifilm. These are the guys I love to talk about and brag about. Whether or not they pay me sponsorships, I still love them. So be sure to go out there and tag them on social media. Tell them that you're enjoying Photo Expo Live. It's excellent. You love it. You enjoyed Robert Trawick. Please bring him back next year. And I'm available for questions. So Sean's going to ask me any questions right now. He's pulling up his laptop and he says, and I need to get some coffee. <laughs> Sean is looking for questions. He's, he's answering questions, maybe not. I'm, I'm looking here, we're looking for questions. Oh, we're looking for questions. Awkward moments of silence. So, uh... <laughs> These T, okay. 
So one question that comes up all the time is the t-shirts that I wear. So this is a design that was done by a friend of mine. And uh, you will see me wearing these t-shirts a lot. I have four of these t-shirts. Oh, sorry. I have four of these t-shirts. And this is like my favorite thing because I love photography. This is my heartbeat. And this is a uh, symbol of my X-Pro3 from Fuji. Um, if you guys follow me on Instagram, I have Treywick Images and Treywick Workshops. I will be tattooing this on my forearm very soon. That's how much I love the Fuji X-Pro3. It's amazing and photography as well. So these t-shirts, I'll get you guys a link and share it somewhere on my website, but it was designed by a friend of mine, uh, Savannah Hayes online, great graphic artist. I love her to death. All right, so we got a few questions here. Yes. Well, you only stand further back if you are going to block the light that's hitting your subject. So if you happen to move your light back, and let's say maybe I'm moving it like 10 feet away, and the light's going to hit my back and create a shadow of me going forward into the scene, then it would be good to get out of the light source and zoom in with a longer lens. Yes, okay, so let's talk about high-speed sync, which is, um, I'm not gonna say it's a misconception, and it's not a misconception, it's a reality, it actually happens. So you have two things, you have hypersync and you have high-speed sync. High-speed sync is um, basically the biggest term that people do, so you have a sync speed, let me put this coffee down so I don't spill my laptop. So remember when we are talking about flash photography on how your exposure is. So your ambient exposure is ISO, um, aperture, and shutter speed. Your flash photography is ISO, aperture, flash duration. With the flash exposure, the shutter just has to be open during the flash burst. So on your camera, you have a maximum sync speed. Most cameras these days are between 200 and 250th of a second. That is the fastest that the flash can, or the shutter speed can open and close and still allow the burst of flash to go and capture the image. When you go above 250th of a second, I'm just using that example because that's what's on my X-T3 is 250th of a second. When I go to 500th of a second, if I'm not using high speed sync, what I receive is a brightly lit or properly exposed half of a frame. The other half is dark because the shutter is already closing before the flash has a chance to expose everything. It's already covered up half of my sensor because the shutter speed is so fast. When you go to a thousandth of a second, it becomes more of a strip down to a quarter. Now, I don't know if this is mathematical, but this is how my mind processes high-speed sync, just so you understand. When you double your sync speed to 500th of a second, you are cutting your time in half, which means that the shutter is going to travel twice as fast. So if I need my flash to be able to expose my entire sensor, the flash has to fire twice very quickly to get one shot before the cut curtain is closing and then another shot before it closes completely. So it's doing two shots to expose the frame because the curtain's closing. When I go to a thousandth of a second, I need to have four pops of light that so I can get the entire shutter because as one curtain is opening, the next one is following right behind, so it's exposing your sensor in slits. So as you increase your shutter speed of high-speed sync, even though your flash may be set to full power, you're effectively reducing the intensity of your light. So you have to take that in consideration. And I don't have a great answer on whether or not using high-speed sync is better than using neutral density filters because in both of those, you're reducing the light intensity coming to the exposure. So if you're trying to do an outdoor shot and you're trying to um, 
expose a great blue sky with your subject, which is definitely going to be set the base and light the face, and the face is really dark, you're going to have to use high speed sync to do that. But because of the high speed sync having to use multiple pops of your strobe, it's going to be difficult for you to use a low power speed light. Uh, luckily, Westcott has done a great job of naming their product. So the FJ80, which is their speed light, is 80 watts of power. The FJ200 is 200 watts of power. The FJ400 is 400 watts of power. If you're going to do that consistently in lot, having a light source with a lot of power is going to be able to give you a good exposure when you're getting in those high speed sync areas. And the FJ400 supports that as well as a freeze mode. And it has the T1 and T5 output on there so you know what your effective shutter speed is. So basically, use your high speed sync. Your camera has a support as well as your light. The technology has to talk to each other. But use it with a light source that has a lot of power to effectively be able to do those multiple pops in that. So hopefully that answers our question in a long form. So another question we got here from a Brandon Heiss was, what is your favorite modifier and your favorite coffee? Okay, my favorite coffee comes from Yode Coffee in Oklahoma City, and they have an, an Ethiopian blend that is to die for, and I cannot wait to get back and be able to try some. The guys there, it's like coming home. When you, when you find that coffee shop that matches your soul, and my soul is black just like coffee, then you really feel at home with these people. If you ever have a chance to go try Yote Coffee in Oklahoma City, I'll meet you there and you can buy me a cup. My favorite modifier has always been the Octobox, only because I like shooting outside. I really enjoy studio work because uh, I get to control everything. The darker the conditions, the more I'm able to control light and I feel much better controlling it than having just to deal with what's available in natural light. But the Octobox allows me great flexibility. Um, I haven't talked to Westcott about this yet. Um, so, you know, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna tell you guys to put your bug in your ear if you're a Westcott user. So I noticed that on the shaft of my Octobox M is threaded. And I was talking to Chuck Caves last night from F-Stop Bags during our photo shoot and our photo walk, and I thought, if that shaft is threaded, could I put a reflector plate on there and turn my Octobox into a quasi-beauty dish? Because I think I can. Because it's threaded. There's a reason it's threaded. I just don't think the guys at Westcott have sent me that piece yet. So go check it out. Go look at the Octobox in with the switch plate, which is, oh my God, it's so easy. If you guys have ever used soft boxes in the past you would set them up and they would stay in the studio and they just took up a lot of space and then if you went on location you had to break them down out of the speed rings and the stupid things would be all bent it was a real pain in the neck westcott remember i told you these guys like these guys are like an umbrella manufacturer back in the day they invented the golf umbrella okay these guys are amazing i could set up my octobox in seconds Basically grab it, stick it on there, bam, I'm good to go. But the switch on the back, I'm able to rapidly change out mounts on that and go from different light brands easily. So it's basically buying one octa box that fits almost any light out there with the appropriate plate. It's very easy. But I'm really interested in this, uh, in this beauty dish modifier from my octa box. It's the best one. Buy the umbrella first. And then after you play with the umbrella, go get the Octobox. You'll thank me later. So can you, uh, I've got somebody that's asked for the, the web address for the PDF. Oh, sure. Can Let me pull, pull that, that up, up real quick. And while you're doing that, I'll ask you another question. Um, do you raise or lower your light source to change the angle of light in any way? Okay, raising and lowering the light source uh, there are a lot of different rules, and you should follow the rules until you learn them enough to break them. So what I like to do when I'm doing the light, and if it's just me, if I'm shooting with other people, I'll be a little more generic. If I'm shooting the light, I like to light the face 
And to me, the nose sticks out the most of anybody. So I will aim my light to be not eye level, but nose level. Because I'm really trying to avoid having bad shadows around people's nose. I think that's one of the things that most people complain about is their nose or their mouth. So I will actually aim the middle of my light to their nose. Now, at the same time as I'm saying that, I want you guys to think of light almost like a water hose in your gardening, okay? So if you have nice rose bushes, you're not gonna take your hose and spray it directly to the rose and destroy all of the petals. So sometimes we'll feather the light away just so some of the edge of the light will hit the subject in a softer way. And it's actually making a harder light source because you turn the light away from the subject, the angle becomes more oblique and it reduces down. But I feel that even though light doesn't bend or curve around corners, it can hit dust particles in the air and actually kind of like, I like to think it black holes into my subject if I turn it too much. So when you're doing that, you can change the direction of the light. So if I have the light here and a person's right here, and I take the light like this, I'm changing the direction of the light. If I turn it up like this, I change the direction of the light. If I raise it, I'm changing the direction of light as well because the spread is now different than it is down here. So anytime you change where the light source is, you're changing the direction along with the size and the relation. Because if I turn my light down, there's less light being seen by the subject. So therefore I've reduced the size of it optically as well as change the direction. So hopefully that answers that question. And there's the presentation link on top. Uh, and you need to do the, it's a bit.ly link. So I kept them all lowercase. And uh, if that doesn't work on your computer, just send me an email, robert at, at tradebookimages.com or john at uh, bedfords.com and we will uh, get that link to you. Sweet. Um, what's the, the most amount of lights you've used on a shoot? And then did you use um, multiple lights on, uh, let's see, the, on the di uh, dynamics of the image? Oh, did multiple lights change the dynamics of the image? There you go. The most amount of lights I've used on an image, man. I would probably say five or six would be the most I think I've ever used. Um, I will have, uh, and I'm, I've done a few of these where I'll do two strip boxes to light the edge, one uh, octo box in the front to light the face, then I'll have two spots in the back and possibly a hair light or a background light. Does it change the dynamics? I don't think you need to have all those lights unless there's a specific story that you're trying to tell or you're trying to create something so you can extract it later for a background replacement or a composite image. I think there's a lot of different ways that people approach lighting. Many people want the lighting to look natural, so they only use one light source. I love a good backlight. Backlight to me is just that one step above using a single light source. So many times when I'm using flambient, I will use the sun as my hair light and light the face. And that, that hair light makes it look natural because your eyes can see that large dynamic range of what's happening in front of you with constant light, but your camera's incapable of capturing that same dynamic range. So by using the flash on the face, we're reducing the dynamic range of the scene and the contrast between our lights and shadows so the camera can capture it. But I don't think it changes the dynamics unless it's the story you're telling. Did anybody give us a thumbs up on the questions and answers? <laughs> yeah, no, they they. Do, okay, all yeah, right. They said, they "Oh, thank it. you, Robert. We're thank doing great." So, yeah. Okay, good. I, I'm not seeing the screen. <laughs> so, if somebody wants to win door prizes from this weekend, do you know how they do that? Yes, they kind of keep watching, and then Sean's going to give me the special keyword codes to let you know how you can get extra chances to win door prizes. They get they get bonus entry. Actually, Tyler's gonna pull it up on the screen here. He's gonna pull up on the screen and show us what that is right now. So folks can go to bedfords.com and then click on the Photo Expo Live Watch Now 
Uh, we'll also put the link here in the chat. And then scroll down, Tyler. All right, so we've got some incredible door prizes uh, that we've we've got from several of our manufacturers: Canon, Nikon, F-stop bags, uh, Ceramonics. We've got some ProMaster stuff in there. Uh, we're giving away three fifty-dollar gift cards, a two hundred-dollar Tamron gift certificate, a four hundred-dollar Sigma gift certificate, two all-access passes to Photocon in October as well as Big Shoot, as well as the uh, classes that they're doing over there. Um, and we're going to give you guys some secret codes uh, during the breaks and introductions of each live speaker. And, uh, you know, I think, I think Westcott would be appropriate. You know, I don't, I don't understand why, why we're not using Westcott as the very first one. Let, let's, do, let's use Westcott. Let's yeah. do Westcott. So, so Tyler, scroll down there. Keep scrolling down. There's scrolling down. tons of ways to enter on this contest. So uh, click the click here to enter. Yep, click there. You're not going to uh, – Tyler's actually our, our tech guy here for the weekend. Tyler, you're not able to win any door prizes. But – Come on. That, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Tyler. <laughs> but scroll down there. You can subscribe to our newsletter. You get 10 entries. You can check out some of the deals on our website. Uh, check out our Facebook pages, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, you can download our app to order prints off of, but the secret code, that is the big one. There is 25 bonus entries for each secret code. Click on enter secret code, Tyler. And the secret code. Click on it. All right, so if you type in Westcott, you're going to get Westcott. 25 bonus entries. There you go. I think that's going to awesome. Westcott is your bonus. Oh, is it? Oh, are you it's, doing it? Yeah, he's doing it. Did you sign in as Robert Trawick, please? Oh, well, look at that. It is right. valid. So everybody go there, check it out. I'll put a link here in the chat for folks. But, uh, but yeah, stay tuned for more bonus codes for all of our great door prizes. Correct. So you guys stay here live so you can get it. So you can be ahead of your friends and win all those great prizes. Well, thank you guys so much for joining my presentation. It's been excellent. So we're going to go, and at 1 o'clock... You're going to have Matthew Dyson. And we've got some uh, great pre-recorded content. Oh, we do have Yeah, some... we do have some pre-recorded oh, content. So beautiful, people can beautiful. check that out, come back. Uh, but be sure you come back for the live event at 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock. It'll be excellent. I'm going to go have a coffee break, and I'll see you guys back at 1 Central Standard Time if you're around the world.
Today we're talking about how your camera makes decisions in regards to autofocus. The AF mode options give us the power to decide how much of the sensor the camera analyzes while it's acquiring focus on a subject. This option can be changed under the AFMF section of the menu or in the quick menu. We often get questions about the all option under the AF mode selection screen. To understand that, we first need to understand the other three options. Single point provides a solitary focus point that gives the camera one location on the sensor to find focus. It can change in location and even in size, but the camera will only search for focus in that one position. Zone allows for the camera to choose from multiple single points within a restricted area. There are three sizes of zone for you to pick from with increasing numbers of focus points in them. Wide slash tracking is a two-part autofocus mode. The wide portion is active when the camera's focus mode selector is placed in the S or single position and allows for the camera to choose freely from all of the focus points on the sensor with no direction from the user. If we leave the AF mode set to wide slash tracking and switch the focus mode selector to C or continuous, we're now in tracking mode. You'll see a white box appear on the screen. The camera will find focus on the subject in the box and will move the focus point across the sensor if the subject moves. Now let's go back to the earlier question. What is all? All is simply a quicker way of navigating between the other three options. Simply push the focus lever directly in and roll the command dial on the back of the camera to access single, zone, and wide slash tracking. The camera will indicate the changing of the autofocus mode at the top of the screen as you scroll through. One last tip. If you have face detection turned on, the camera will automatically override your chosen focus area when it finds a face, so it may not always be the best option. Now you know more about how your Fujifilm camera handles autofocus areas. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Solentano, Canon Explorer of Light, and I'm super excited to be in the studio today photographing an awesome family. We have Lauren, Josh, Will, and Natalie. We'll be photographing them using the Westcott FJ400. We'll also be using the three x four softbox, and we'll also be tethering. So I will be going directly from my camera wirelessly into Capture One on my computer using the new Air Direct by Tether Tools. Um, it's just an amazing system. I'm also on the Tether Tools uh, wheels on my tripod, which turn my tripod from just a regular tripod into a rolling tripod anytime I want. And we're just going to have a great time today in the studio working with this great family. So we're going to get started and we're going to roll through it. I'm going to talk you guys through the session. What I'm doing, uh, we are transferring or tethering to Capture One in the computer. And this way it's great. I can see exactly what I'm doing. At 50 years old, it's really hard for me to see the back of this camera without my glasses on. So tethering in the studio is a huge advantage so that I can actually see what my lighting looks like. Um, mom can see what the, what the kids look like. It really helps mom relax and know that we're getting the images she wants without her having to come back to the back of the camera. The other nice thing about wireless um, and the Air Direct is that when you have young kids in the studio, there's no wires. So I don't have to worry about anyone tripping over wires. I'm using my mono lights. Again, no wires. The FJ400 are battery operated lights. And so I have complete freedom to walk around the studio without worrying about tripping over anything. So we're going to get started. Natalie is going to be our first light test and we're just going to have fun, right? You good? Yeah. You can talk. It's okay. <laughs> I promise I'm not going to bite. Is that okay? Yeah, I, and if I bite, it's just little nibbles. 
so it's not gonna hurt. Is that okay? All right, good. All right, so I'm gonna jump right in here. Oh my gosh, that is too cute. Okay, so what I want you to do is maybe just bring your hands to your hips, like right here. Yeah, give them a little attitude, and then just drop your shoulder this way just a little bit. So generally when I'm working with children that I'm just getting to know, I'm gonna warm them up for about five, 10 minutes, have them do some different things, make some funny faces for me. So let me see your mad face. That's it, let me see your sad face. Let me see your super surprised, really Christmas excited face. There you go, birthday face. And then sad face, and then very serious face. Yes, intense. So I want you to look at me like you have a big question to ask me. Do you have something to ask me? Oh, that's amazing. So those are the expressions I really like, the in-between, the mad, sad, and then after the facial muscles start to warm up, kids start to get really comfortable. Are you feeling better already? Yeah, see? So, so we're just gonna go from there. All right, I'm gonna bring this over for you so that you can put your feet up here. And we're gonna turn you a little bit, put your feet right up there. Um, I'm in the studio and we are gonna be working with a family of four. We're in a really tight space today. So what I did was I brought my uh, three by four soft box above my head, almost like a beauty type of lighting, but a little bit more spread out so that it will really light the entire group evenly as I go. And because we're in a small space, I don't wanna have to jockey my light around in too many places. So I set it up right overhead. It's really soft, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a really soft, natural uh, light. And you can see right here that's creating a really pretty shadow right under her chin and just really beautiful flat light on her face. So when I'm working with moms who are around my age, we don't really like to be lit from the side because it highlights all the things we don't like about our skin. So flat lighting for moms is really actually awesome and that's why I like having the soft box up above my head for nice easy flat lighting. Okay, you're good? I explain as I go, is that okay? All right, are you not in school right now? Or are you doing homeschool or how, how, yeah, how's it working? Yeah, uh-huh. Do you miss your friends at school? Yeah, yeah I bet. Um, so you're ready to go back to school. I never thought in my life I would hear so many kids talk about how much they can't wait to go back to school. Like usually kids are like, I don't wanna go back to school, blah, 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 but now you wanna go back, right? Yeah, okay, so bring your knees to your, uh, your elbows to your knees, like lean in, but hands over hand like this. Oh, that's awesome. And then turn your nose to me all the way. That is perfect. Stay right there, because I'm gonna come and adjust hair for you. Is that okay? Are we good? Okay, all right, good. Okay, that's it. And tilt your head with me just a drop more. You got it, perfect. Hold it right there. And then turn your nose with me just a little bit more. Relax your shoulders and lift up a tiny bit. There you go. And then just back for me just a tiny bit. Beautiful. I want you to stay right there. Oh, that's beautiful. Can you see yourself on the screen? <laughs> you can, that's awesome. Hold it right there. And let's see, we're gonna be right up here. That's the last one we did. Oh, I love that. You like that, mom? <laughs> yeah. So what I normally like to do is start with one subject and then start adding people. So I usually will start with one of the kids and then add a parent, then add another parent, then add a sibling and then kind of uh, work in groupings so that I build. So from here we'll build and we'll bring your mom over. So sit up nice and tall for me, straight. And then Lauren, you'll come to this side. You're a little bit taller than me, so you'll separate your feet for me just a little bit coming onto this side. Perfect. Okay, so Natalie, sit up nice and tall for me. You can bring your hands and then you just bring your hand on hers and then lean toward your mom just a little bit. Perfect. Oh, I love that. Yep. So I want you to tilt your head this way, Natalie. Yep, and then you lean into her that way. So, but uh, Lauren, tilt your head up just a little bit and then lean together with your bodies. Yeah! And then Natalie, turn your nose to your mom just a drop. That's perfect. And then eyes back at me and then relax your shoulders. There, yes, that's it, that's it. Hold it right there. I'm just gonna come and fix hair so no one move because your hair is in here. I'm gonna bring this hair a little bit in the front. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Because it's all about hair for the girls, right? Yeah. So, there you go. Perfect. And then just lean right in there. Perfect. And then Natalie, turn your nose to me just a drop. You got it. And Lauren, bring your nose to me just a little bit. Beautiful. And then Natalie, you're really happy. I <laughs> there you go, yes! So I'll just work expressions as I'm going. And she's so funny because she's looking at herself. <laughs> yeah, and so you can see them come up. And so, all right, so relax a little bit. That's all right, that's, that's, 
That's what pro that's what post production's for. Okay, so Natalie, up nice and tall. You got it, girl. And then I'm just gonna adjust my tripod a little bit. Beautiful. And then just lean together. Beautiful. And Natalie, turn your face to me just a little bit. You got it. That's it, Lauren. Perfect. And then just soft smiles, like almost no smile at all. Relax your forehead just a little bit. <laughs> That's mom's for you. Impossible. Yeah, that is. You just did it. And you're looking at me right here. Beautiful. Yeah. Soft baby smile. Squeeze into your mom just a little bit. Yes. I love that. Stay right there. Okay, Josh, come on over. Everybody stay where you are. So building on this group, I'll bring dad in right here. Beautiful. And then, so you'll bring this foot around right here. You'll grab on her elbow right in here and then bring your heads together like in a triangle. So lean over her this way. Yes. And then bring your heads together. Now you straighten your head out for me just a little bit. Yes. All right. We're going to go this way. Josh, lean over this way, over her shoulder just a little bit more and then connect. And then Natalie, lift up just a little bit taller. Beautiful. And turn your nose towards your dad just a little bit. Yep, but back to me just a little bit more. Yes, get a little taller for me. And Josh, lean over her shoulder just a little bit more. Bring your nose to the camera. There you go. Ah, I love that. Hold it right there. All right, we're missing somebody here, I think. Don't you think? Are we missing someone? Yes? Oh, that's I good. That All right, so, yeah. Perfect. So, yep, Josh, and then lean through them a little bit more. Yep, and then turn. So, um, back your body up just a touch. So, your feet go back, and then you lean from the upper chest. Yes. All right. And Natalie, you're going to turn your face to me just a drop. Beautiful. And then we'll turn your feet this way just a little bit. Yep. And actually put your one foot up on the rung by on her stool. So bring that foot up there. Yep. So you turn your body and then put this foot up there. Yeah. How's that? And I'll give you this for your other foot. This will help you sit up a little straighter. Yep. 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 No, it's good. And then perfect. And then Natalie, lean back towards your mom and dad. Josh, you're perfect where you are. Perfect. And then squeeze in everybody just a little bit. shot right there. I love it. Squeeze in just a little bit more. And Natalie, I, I need to see that happy, excited face. There it is. Oh my gosh. Hold it right there. Okay, so um, Josh, you'll step out for one second. There it is. Where's, where's the happy? Oh, there it is. I got it. So yeah, that's transferring so fast. That's awesome. Okay. But they're like, the kids are like, hey, 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 can I see myself? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, can you hold this for me for a second? And that's why I like my tripod. Okay, so you're going to come around to this side. I'm going to mix you guys up just a little bit. So hop off there. Hop off. There you go. Perfect. I think you'll be really good here. I'm going to back you up just a tiny bit. So hang on. You're going for a ride. There you go. I'll be right in here. And then... You'll come right back into that spot, Lauren. And then you're going to come right here on this side of your mom. So go ahead and step up there. Yeah. I love it. You know what? I kind of like that. That's it. Natalie, turn toward your mom just a little bit more. Beautiful. And then Will, turn your face to your mom just a little bit. Awesome. So are you liking homeschool or do you like miss school? Which do you prefer? You prefer school too? I've never heard kids say that. It's just the craziest thing. And you're excited, Natalie. I can see it in your face. I need happier. Just a little bit. There we go. And I'm going to just mix it up a little bit more. Yep. Jump yeah. down. I'm going to seat your mom, and then I'm going to stand you guys around her. I like to mix it up. You ready? There you go. You good? Yep. So I'm going to have you sit here. Perfect. All right. Okay. Can you hop right up here? Ah, and so you'll turn this way and then let's see, can you put your feet on there? Mm -hmm. So you're at the edge of the stool. Mm -hmm. Yep. There you go. And then what I want you to do is bring your arms in to your mom. You're going to wrap around this way, turn into her just a little bit. And I want you to lean towards her. Okay. So you come up on this side. Ready? Step right up there for me. I feel like the circus guy. Step right up, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Children of all ages. And then you're going to wrap your arms around your mom this way. And then you're going to lean into her that way. Okay. We do this all the time at home, don't we? Yeah. And then, and then you're going to, like, <laughs> be all nice and like, Mommy, we love you. Yeah, like that. <laughs> okay, we'll lean into your mom just a little bit. You got it. Hold it right there. Oh, Natalie, that's perfect. So we'll lean on your mom just a little bit more. That's it right there. Perfect. Hold it. Yeah, I'm just going to focus on your eye. Beautiful. Squeeze together just a little bit more. Oh, I love it. Oh, they're so cute next to you. <laughs> I love that. Look at that. 
Oh. That's awesome, you guys. Do you like it? All right, so we'll we'll jump you out for a second. Okay. You know, when you're talking to kids, especially younger kids, you know, asking them what they're interested in, finding out what they like about school, just having conversations. Usually I try to be on my tripod so I don't have to be behind the camera, but we're in a small space, so I switched to a lens where um, I needed to be off my tripod. Okay, little munchkin, you're gonna come over to this side. That's awesome, I love your faces, don't move, I promise you. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? You guys, squeeze together just a little bit, pretend like you like each other. Okay, those are some really good smiles. They're really good. All right, let's switch it up, okay? So I'm gonna switch you guys up. How painful was that? Was it terrible? Yes. Are you melting? Yeah. yeah, you're melting. All right, hop down from there for a second. You're gonna hop up here. And let's get her a little bit taller. Natalie, turn towards me just a little bit more. Yep, and then Will, lean towards me just a little bit. You got it. Yes! Oh, you guys! Okay, hold on, we're gonna get you focused. There we go. And Natalie, I want you to lift up a little taller. Turn your face to your brother just a little bit. I want you guys to lean together. Get your faces in. Yes! Oh my gosh! Are you kidding me? Will, lean into her just a drop. Tilt your head to her just a little bit. A little bit more. Tilt your head. Tilt, tilt. You got it. Okay, don't make me come over there and move your neck. Okay, up a little bit higher, ready? Okay, don't move. Don't move, don't move. This this pain will be over soon, I promise. Okay, he, I tilt his head and then his hair goes down. Okay, don't move. What's that? Oh yeah, what happened? I must have, oh, I moved something. Hang on, thank you. We moved from 100 ISO to auto. There you, ah! And Natalie, chin up for me just a little bit, sweetheart. You got it, hold it right there, nobody move. Oh, I love it. Will, you're really, really happy, really. I mean, you have never been happier in your whole life. <laughs> squeeze together, squeeze into your sister just a little bit. Nobody move, stay right there. Oh, that's so good, stay right there. Lauren, come over here, lean in. I want you to get in right here and then squeeze them in so that they have to hold each other. Yeah, oh, the battle royale. So are you like um, Fortnite or Minecraft, which one? Ah, there you go. Lean over the kids a little bit more. Watch that back hand. Yeah, Will, lean closer to me just a little bit. Lean over your sister this side, this side. A little bit closer to me. Natalie, get a little taller. Yes. Will, come closer to me just a little bit. Chin down just a drop and tilt your head to your sister. Tilt it. Tilt it. Yes. Ah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so cute. Okay. So you jump out. You jump in. Okay. Nobody move. Squeeze together. I know it's so painful. So Fortnite, yes, that's what I'm looking for, yes, there we go. <laughs> okay, so can you jump in there now on the other side? I want that, that's what I want right there. The big squeezy, happy, everybody, yep, hold it, I gotta turn this way just a little bit, yeah. So Will, I really want you to hold on to your sister. Put your hand on your dad's hand, so yes. You, you gotta hold hands, you gotta hold hands, yes. And everybody squeeze together, yes. Lauren, squeeze in there, get right on over the shoulder, yes. Natalie, chin up a little bit. Will, chin down just a little bit, yes, 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 ah! Oh, that's gonna be amazing. Oh, I love that. All right, hold on. I know it hurts, but you know, hurt, like, yeah. love hurts. <laughs> and it's so cute. So cute. Just awesome. Yeah, I know, but we keep shooting. That's why I shoot a lot of pictures in a row, so we get your eyes open. So a lot of times with young kids, um, especially this age, brothers and sisters like, ew, cooties, they don't like each other. And so you have to just keep working and squeeze them in together and have fun and tickle and keep moving. And one of the great things about the FJ 400 is the recycle time is so good that I can just keep shooting one right after the other, even on battery power. That thing just keeps firing. It never misses a shot. Getting them into the computer, mom can see what we're getting. I think she feels really happy. The kids look good. Now we just need you by yourself. Okay, so you hop up here. So throughout the rotation, I try to get each child by themselves. Each, oh, thank you. Woo, magic. So I try to get each of the kids by themselves, the two kids together, mom with both of the kids, dad with both of the kids. Um, this way, from a sales perspective, when I meet with mom after the session, she loves everything and then she just has to go home with a big album or, or an image box of 30 of her favorite images. So I shoot pretty quickly. I move very quickly, especially with kids this age because we do lose them. You're already done with me, aren't you? What? You're, are you done with me? Are you like, lady, I'm so tired of this? Kind of, right? <laughs> You're awesome. All right, so just... Take a couple of minutes with Will here, because I think you're like pretty rock star. So do you play Minecraft at all? Uh, yeah. 
No, not at all. My daughter was a Minecraft kid. So, okay, one foot up here. Perfect. And then you're going to take this elbow and lean it into the knee and nice and tall with that, uh, that lower back comes. Yeah, there you go. Um, so Fortnite, is that the one where you like build communities and then like, how does it work? I don't know how it works. Tell me how Fortnite works. Uh, you find people and then you go into a war. You go, oh, a war. Okay. So you'll like Mulan. There's a big war in the movie. See, this is a fa family movie for everyone. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, you, hunt down. you hunt people down. So like, are you, please tell me you're hunting like bad guys down. Like you're the good guy hunting bad guys. Oh, just other people in general. <laughs> okay. All right, hold it right there. Tilt your head with me just a drop this way. You got it. You're doing good. I like it. All right, hold it right there. I'm going to get a little closer. I'm going to get a little closer. Chin down just a little bit for me, buddy. Yes, and don't, don't giggle. Whatever you do, do not giggle. This is not fun. I don't want to see you being happy. <laughs> you pretend to be miserable. Where's your mad face? So I usually, when I'm working with the kids, I'll try to get all the stuff with the kids first because after a while you totally lose kids and they do need a break, especially at this age. They need a snack. They can't sit there for that long. Otherwise, they really start, their posture starts to go. And so usually at some point in the session, I'll give them a break, photograph mom and dad. This way they get a snack. They get to play on the computer, <laughs> on the phone, whatever. And it just gives them a little bit of a mental break. So um, yeah, so what I think he's, yep, no, you're good right where you are. I'm just gonna twist this way. There we go. Perfect. I'm just going to adjust. There we go. Beautiful. Now, from where you both are, lean towards the camera a little bit. There you go. Perfect. Beautiful. And Josh, tilt your head to her just a little bit more. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. And then Lauren, tilt this way for me just a drop. Yes. Now, Josh, lean into her. Perfect. Hold on. I want to make sure I'm focused on that eye. Beautiful. Hold it right there. I've got one crazy hair. There you go. It's, it was to the side. See that one little yep. crazy hair right there. So, yep. Okay, nice and relaxed. Perfect. Yes. Lauren, relax just a little bit. Take a deep breath. There it is. <laughs> when you smile, when you're smiling. No, no, you're good. Relax. relax. Okay. But when you did, you just lit up. It was oh. so perfect. Yeah, there you go. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness. You guys are too cute together. Are your mom and dad cute or what? Yeah, okay. So I love this so much that I'm gonna leave you guys there. Don't move, don't move. Let's have some fun because we're almost wrapped up with this. What do you think? So let's get some apple boxes over here. Okay, you guys stay where you are and okay. So, all right, Natalie, come on over here. Hop up right there and then Will, come over here, bud. Hold on, I'm going this way just a little bit. Yes, squeeze in. Lauren, relax those shoulders. <laughs> relax This one in particular, yep. They're squeezing in on you. Yeah, I got you. That's it. Yes. Will, perfect. Squeeze in. Squeeze your mom's elbow right there. Bring your hand to her elbow. Yes. And then lean in. And then Natalie, turn your face to me just a little bit more. Yes. Squeeze in. And then Josh, go towards Natalie just a little bit. Yep. Ah. And then Josh, go this way just a little bit. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This way. Will, go this way just a little bit. Yes. But a little halfway between where you were. Yes. And now lean towards me just a little bit. Are you ready? Natalie, chin up just a little bit. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's the one. Okay, oh, I love that one. Okay, whew, I think we got it all. Nice. I really do. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so just a couple of quick things um, about the whole session while we're wrapping up. Um, we moved really quickly. I think we got this done in maybe about an hour. Um, we got all the combinations, each of the children, children together despite the fact they didn't really want to do it. We made it happen. A lot of times I just squeeze them in and just have some fun with it. Um, but simple lighting setup, one soft box overhead for nice, easy, um, soft, flat lighting, a little bit overhead so we get some nice shadowing underneath the chin and um, using uh, the Westcott and the tether tools together is just a really awesome combination. Okay, so we're done with our session in the studio today and it was awesome. I'm really excited about what we were able to capture. I just wanna quickly go over the equipment we used today. We were using the Westcott FJ400, the new strobe by Westcott Monolite, battery operated with the FJX2 trigger, which is amazing as well. Um, it triggers almost all camera brands. I'm working on my Canon today. I'm on the Canon R6. 
um, and the trigger has worked for all of my cameras, uh, from the Mark IV to the Mark V to the Mark VI. And we're also working with tether tools, a um, couple of different things. Uh, one, I have the tether tool wheels on my tripod, which are amazing. So when I'm in the studio, I can easily just roll my tripod around uh, without having to pick it up. It's one of my favorite things. It folds down really small. And then the Air Direct, which is one of the newer products and it makes shooting tethered an absolute breeze. I can wirelessly tether from my camera right into Capture One. And we also were using the on-site power supply. So you can take it on location, you charge it up, and it's good to charge and keep your battery, you keep your computer running for hours while you're out on location, which is awesome. We'll be heading to the park later on, where we'll be taking all of the gear with us so we can shoot tethered there as well. And it's just been a breeze. This is part of my routine, and it's really great to shoot tethered in the studio so that parents can see what you're capturing. The kids get really excited about it. And it's also a little bit less work for me later on. I don't have to download all the images. They go right into the computer. It's especially helpful when I'm photographing headshots in the studio, so this way, the people who are getting their headshot done can choose the ones that they want right away before they even leave the studio. And so that's probably one of the biggest advantages for me shooting tethered in the studio. So again, we have the FJ400. We use the three by four softbox today overhead, nice, easy, even flat lighting um, paired with the trigger, my 70 to 200 on the R6 and the tether tools air direct. Hey everyone, it's Michelle Celentano. We're at the park now with a new family, all set up. We've got our light set up, our Westcott FJ400. We are now using the Rapid Box Large so that we can get some nice feathered light. We are set up with our computer. We're set up with our Air Direct so we can tether out here as well, which is great when you're out on location. It's super easy to see your screen on your computer as opposed to the back of the camera sometimes. And again, my 50 year old eyes, I can't see very well. So the computer is really helpful for me. We have a family of six. We have Matt and Therese and all four of their kids and they're super cute and they're young. So we probably have a small amount of time. So we're going to get started. Here we go. 5.6. Yeah, we probably do need to focus. All right, guys, here we go. Hi, bud. Yeah. Okay, so you guys looking right here at me? Beautiful, and don't you giggle. Come towards me a little bit with that light. Yep, turn that way for me just a little bit. Okay, so let's see, just put your thumbs in your pants pocket for me. Perfect, you got it. So can you push that light up a little bit higher, Paul? light up a little higher. There you go. So I made our subject higher. Colin's a little bit higher. So we're going to lift the light. So at the bottom of the light is about his chin. Yep. That's perfect. There you go. And ah, that's good. And I'm going to just be right in here. Perfect. Let's take a quick look at it. Make sure we like the exposure. Hold it right there. And where are you? There you are. Oh, I love it. It's good. Okay. Now all you need to do is just look at me. And then, so Smile, Colin. Okay, let me work on him. Hang on. Okay, so perfect. Drop your shoulder for me this way just a little bit. Yes, that is perfect. And then turn your nose to me just a little bit and tilt your head with me just a drop. You got it. That is awesome. It's much better. Your sister says so. Yeah, I feel like she's the boss of the family. Is this true? Yeah, I thought I felt I felt like that was like a thing. Like she might be the boss of the family. Hold it right there. Okay, come over here with me, little Miss Boss. I love a good boss because I'm a boss too. It's like it's like women boss power, right? Okay, so jump down from here. I'm gonna have you jump down, and we'll lower the light just a little bit. Are these pockets? Yeah. Oh, put your hands in your pockets. I love pockets. Okay, and then I want you to hold it right here, and then you're gonna lean your heads together. Okay. Ah, hey, but Mom. but I want you to lean forward to the camera. Yes. Okay. Ready? Oh my gosh, you guys are too cute. Okay, Nalita, I want you to turn your back to your brother a little bit more so your feet face the yes there we go that's what i'm talking about so chin up sweetheart just a little bit yep i'm gonna come over and adjust you just a little bit you got it you're doing good so relax just a little bit let him lean to you let let him do the work okay okay so you're gonna lean to her right there now turn your head this way okay so with little ones sometimes you got to get in there and just move them exactly where you want them exactly okay nalita turn your face towards colin just a little bit perfection and I'm gonna just jump in. I'm gonna do a little hair fixing, zhuzhing. We call this zhuzhing. You stay where you are. Here we go, ready? 
That is awesome. Oh my gosh, you guys, that is too cute. Okay, stay right there. Colin, move your hand on her shoulder. So move those fingers where I can't see them. Nope, the other one. Keep that hand where it was. Yes, you got it right. And lower that hand just a little bit. Yep, and then lean to your sister a little bit. Perfect. Oh my goodness, hold it right there. That is awesome. Don't move. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, don't move because we need to add some children to this. Okay, so you're the big brother, right? I need you to come around, put this foot right here, and you hang on to everybody, see? So nobody goes anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Uh oh, ah, 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 let me see all your faces. Okay. What? Uh oh. Oh, you fell down. What happened? Yep. Yep, that's fine. One more time. One more time. Okay, everybody's got to look at me real quick. You ready? Oh, my goodness. Yes, but look at me. Oh, where'd he go? That was fast. One shot and we were done. Okay, that's 18 months. Okay, so Colin, come in. And then everyone, on the count of three, everybody stay still. So go right between them. Right? Yep. Yep. And then Colin, come around this side of your sister. Yep. So, yep. Hold on. Okay, so put this foot up here. Nope, not that one, the other one. Sorry. And then bring this foot around this way. So I want you around your sister. Yeah, and hang on here. You're between them. Okay. What? Nobody move. Nobody move. Colin, twist to me just a little bit more. Turn towards your sister just a little bit. Yep. So, Colin, turn a little bit. The other way, and we have a bride and groom back there. Yay. Okay, so I'm <laughs> gonna move. Uh, everybody, look at me. Give her a big hug. Colin, lean in. Give her a big hug. Put your hand on your sister. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, hi. I see everybody. Woo. Yay. Evan. Evan, Evan, Evan. Look at me. Okay, put your hands down back there. Yes. Uh, how, Lolita, thank you. Put your hands down, sweetheart. Not on your brother. Yes. Now lean in. So, Colin, you squeeze in. Everybody, look at me. Evan. Evan. Oh. Okay, jump in there and put his shirt down for me. Yep, uh, yep, thank you. And then Colin, hold on to Natalie. Hold on to Natalie. Ah, look at me, yay! Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Yay! <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> the outtakes are priceless. Oh my goodness. Oh, there we go, we have it, we have it. Colin, move in, move in, move in. Put your shirt down, put your shirt down. There you go, Colin, lean in. Put your arms around everyone. Put your arms, yes. Oh, Natalie, look at me, look at me. Oh my goodness, here we go. We keep shooting, right? Up, oh, don't you keep your, I'm gonna get your belly. I'm gonna get your belly. I'm gonna get your belly. I'm gonna get your, I'm gonna get your belly. Look at me, I'm gonna get your belly. I'm gonna get your belly. I'm gonna get your belly. Gonna get your belly. Can it get your belly? Okay, keep everybody hug, hugging, hugging, hugging. Ah, look at me, Colin, look at me, look at me. Oh my goodness, yay. Yes. Okay, everybody, hands down. Hands down. Squeeze in, Colin. Squeeze in. Put Yeah, put your feet up on the block you had them before. Squeeze in. Wrap around. Yes, wrap around. Everybody, everybody, shirts down, hands down. Ready? Simon says, Simon says, lean in. Simon says, squeeze together. No, Simon says, put your shirt down. Put your shirt down. Yes. <laughs> everybody, look at me. Ready? On the count of three, everybody's going <laughs> to. Ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream! So everybody says, I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Did you know that song? So sweetie, come this way, right in the middle of them, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, yep, right there, and then you come around this way. Okay, this is gonna be it. Okay, no one laugh, no one giggle, no one giggle. <gasps> Colin, move in just a little bit. Squeeze in, okay. Yeah, okay, so put this foot um, behind your sister, then put this foot up. You got it. Then I want you to lean in here. You got to lean in. You're the big brother. I need you to hang on to everybody. Move forward just a little bit. Squeeze in. Yes, right there, everybody. Oh, okay. Woo, yes. Oh, hands down, Natalie. Everybody smile. Every, one, two, three. Ah, put your shirt down. Keep looking at me. Yes. Ah, everybody's happy. Happy. Say, gee, oh, put your shirt down. Ready? I'm going to go peekaboo. Peekaboo. Bring Natalie back just a little bit so she squeezes in between you guys. So, yep. Oh, no, 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 wait one second. Wait one second. I know he's okay. Let's give him a break. So, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have a wedding going on behind us. This is great. And then we have an 18 month old and a one year old. No, 18 month and three year. Yeah. Woo. So here's the thing.
thing. I don't know if you noticed it, but that flash was firing repeatedly without a problem. And when you have kids this young, you have to shoot that fast. You're shooting for expression. You're shooting for the minute they get the shirt down. They're shooting for the minute the big smile comes out. So you're just shooting for that moment to moment expression. And that, that flash has been firing flawlessly. So, all right. So what I'm going to do next is the whole family, because I don't think the kids will last much longer than that. So let's work on that. Okay, here we go. Yes, we're in good shape. So when we're ready, you're gonna get up nice and tall and lean on your dad. So on high knees. Yes, exactly. Okay, how are you on your, are you okay on your knees? Yeah. Okay, it won't be for very long, but I want you like kind of right in here, leaning over everyone. Bring this hand forward just a little bit. And so you'll wrap around and then like maybe hold him here on your, okay. yep. Okay, okay. So I gotta change my direction a little bit. I'm gonna come off my tripod so I can move around a little bit easier. Yes! And then can you put both knees on the floor? Yep. And then swing your feet around so I don't see them. Yes, there we go. Ha! All right, everybody, right here. Yes, looking at me. Okay, I got um, Natalie. Cross your ankles for me, sweetheart. And can we take his shoes off real quick? Can you take off Evan's shoes real quick? Yep. Cross. Yep, cross and slide her feet out this way just a little bit. Okay, yeah, go cut through. No problem, no problem. Congratulations. All right, you ready? Perfect. And uh, Therese, up a little higher. Perfect. Yes, and Evan, Natalie, hands in your lap, sweetheart. Put your hands in your lap. There you go. Colin, lean on your dad. Lean on your dad. Evan, Evan. So, Evan, <laughs> Evan. Okay, Paul, stand behind me, try to get Evan to laugh, and see if you can get his hand out of his mouth. Yep. Yay, everybody looking at me, Natalie. Oh, you guys are awesome. Colin, lean over your dad just a little bit more. Keep smiling at me, everybody. Oh, you guys look so good. Everybody's happy. Lift up a little taller. Yep, Matt, lift up a little taller. Beautiful. Yes. Oh my gosh, we got this. Natalie, I need one big smile. Keep going. Yes, Colin, Evan. There we go, oh my gosh, yes, we got it. Okay, we're firing, 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 firing. So we get like that perfect image of, oh my God, the whole park is staring at me. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, it's beautiful. Yeah, you guys gotta come take a quick look at it. That's a wrap. Um, I am sweating, are you sweating? Yep. Yeah, we're all sweating. It's really humid and hot out today, but we did it. We had beautiful outdoor light. We had, I'm out here with Paul, come on over here. We're out here, Paul is um, in charge of the light. So we're out here, one light, one modifier, the FJ400. Um, we were tethering to our computer. I was able to see the shots as we were getting them in real time, which is just awesome. Um, we had so much fun when you're dealing with kids these ages. These guys are awesome, right? Cause they're like nine and seven, nine and eight. How old are you? Eight, eight yeah. And you're 10? Nine. Nine, yeah. And then you have three and 18 months, which is why we're sweating right now, but it's perfect. Everything you get with this age is amazing and it's just fun. And I think everybody had fun. Yeah. yeah. And so when you have the right tools to get the job done, no matter where you are, that is one of the keys to success in the industry and in your business. So I highly recommend getting the right tools for the right job and making sure that you're totally equipped with everything you need. For me, that's my Westcott lights, that's my tripod, it's my Tether Tools Air Direct. It's making sure I have everything I need on scene or in studio. That's a wrap guys, it was a great day. Hey everyone, Luke here from Bedford Camera and Video, and I've got another episode of What's in the Bag. And today we're going to be talking about the F-Stop Talopa 50 liter.
So this is a really large bag. It's a 50 liter bag, but it doesn't really feel like it. So we have this bag loaded down with about 36 pounds of camera gear. Now, I wanna start walking through a lot of the features on the outside and then we'll break into the inside. Now, there is a ton of different things you can do from the exterior of this bag, not to mention even more when you add some of the accessories that you can get for this bag from F-Stop. Now, for the first thing where I wanna talk about is out front. This has a tripod holding system right on the front of it. It's utilizing a clip and strap system, but there's a little bit more to it than what you would initially think. So if I go ahead and undo this and slide out this tripod, you'll notice that it has a clip that goes across the front of the bag that really helps secure the tripod in. It also has a lower clip here really utilized for someone that is trying to trek with skis or a snowboard or something like that that is significantly longer so that you have more options of securing your tripod or equipment. Now, on the bottom of this, you also have a pocket. This pocket is designed to put the foot of a tripod into, and you'll notice that it actually has a hole at the bottom of this for drainage. So if you're utilizing your tripod in a wet condition, such as a river, a creek, something like that, a lot of times it actually will hold some water over time. So that will allow it to drain out properly and not soak your bag. Now, the outside of this bag is designed with a ripstop nylon for superior durability. Now, on the bottom side of this bag, you'll notice that it actually has a different type of material. And that material is going to be a rubberized, weather sealed type of material so that if you set this bag down on a a moisture rich environment it's not going to seep through to your camera gear now on the outside here still there's going to be a padded part here that is going is designed to wear well with a tripod on it it also has these little bungee cables up top that is designed to hold hiking poles or something of that nature as well now there is a large compartment right here on the front side of this bag that opens up really wide and this is going to be great for putting things that you need quick access to such as a wallet a phone something of that nature now the great thing about all of these zippers is a ykk weather resistant zipper so that it is designed to be through the elements now let's go ahead and zip that up and start looking at the others now from here we're going to go to the side it has more straps on the side so that you can attach it, even a tripod on the side of your bag if you don't want to remove access to that front pocket. So if I go ahead and unclip this, I've got a full-size water bottle. Now, a great thing about this pocket, on both sides it's the same. You actually have a Velcro expansion. So if you're not wanting to utilize this pocket to the full capability and packing it full you can actually make it more minimal and out of the way at the bottom of this bag on the side you'll notice that there's another handle it's designed so that you can pull it easily out of a, a trunk or the truck bed and it'll also be great for attaching other accessories like carabiners and so on so when we go to the other side here you notice that it has the same exact uh, pocket structure as the other side. You have two clips so that you can secure another tripod or something of that nature. You can expand this pocket with the Velcro so that it's a larger pocket. And then you have another accessory handle here. Now, the great thing about this bag too is the fact that it has a built-in bladder holder. So this is designed for people that are really wanting to go out and trek through the woods and have a significant uh, travel in the camping realm or hiking realm. This is great because you can put a bladder in there so that you can run your actual um, H2O hose out and it will clip into your strap. So you're gonna have it right there ready to go. 
A great feature about that pocket is the fact that it is also weather sealed. So on the inside, if your uh, bladder leaks, it is perfectly fine. It's not going to seep into your camera gear. Now, on the top of this bag, there's a couple of pockets. On the top, you're going to have an, a quick, easy access pocket so that you can put um, some smaller items in. I'm gonna unzip that one. Got a full-size rain jacket. Now, there are pocket and uh, there are mesh dividers in here with other zippers that you can keep things separated very easily. Now, when I get into the inside, you'll start to see kind of how it all comes together. Now, let's go ahead and talk about these straps really fast. So these straps are designed so that you can carry a significant amount of weight in this bag comfortably. It's going to have adjustments for the shoulders so that it can pull the weight away from your shoulders and neck and disperse it more to your torso and waist. Now, on this, it's going to have multiple D-rings so that you can easily attach any further accessories you may need. On the chest strap, it has an integrated whistle for safety measures. Now, on the waistband itself, there are multiple adjustments so that you can uh, tighten this around your waist properly. It also has plenty of hook loops for additional accessories. And then you have an, a uh, backside loaded camera compartment. This compartment is designed with a ton of padding on the back so that you're comfortable when you're carrying a lot of weight. There's a really cool way about this bag is that you can open it up from either the back side or you can slide the whole mechanism out and have your entire cube ready to go. Now, let's go ahead and break this open and see what all we have in here. Okay, so as we open this up, You'll notice on the inside here, whoop, you'll notice on the inside of the lid that there are additional sections so that you can attach accessories, cables, and so on. It has a built-in pocket up top so that you can easily access that even if you unzip the bag halfway. Now, there is a ton of gear in here. So the first thing I'm gonna pull out, we got the A7C with the 28 to 60 the Sigma uh, 50 millimeter 1.5 uh, 1.4 the Sigma 20 or the 14 to 24 2.8 we've got a Ninja Atomos V we've got the 35 millimeter 1.4 and the 24 to 70 2.8 not to mention a7R4 with the new 150 to 500 millimeter from Sigma as well. But there's still more. We've got a extra hard drive for the Ninja, lavalier microphone, transmitter and receiver for the microphone, a monitor mount, extra battery for the monitor, Two card cases and a battery charger. Now, there's also an additional compartment for your laptop on the other side of this cube. For that, I'm going to access this from the top. I've got a full size sleeping bag here. Thirteen inch MacBook Pro, and more compartments to store things. So on the inside, the main compartment, you're going to have an additional uh, zipper pocket here with a mesh fitting, so you can see what's inside of it. Now, this is a really cool design because the bag itself has an aluminum frame, just like a traditional pro end hiking bag or a uh, cross country bag. So it's going to have a real rigid feel even if there's nothing in it. 
Now, the great thing about these bags from F-Stops is the fact that they utilize a cube compartment. This will allow you to actually slide out the entire compartment for your camera gear. Why is that important? Well, if your bag gets super dirty and you need to easily clean it, you don't have to remove every piece of equipment you have. You can remove just that one compartment and everything's out of the bag. That makes it really great for a day use as well. If you don't wanna take a lot of camping gear or camera gear and you need camping, no problem, this will be the bag for you. You can get multiple different sizes of these cubes as well. So if you have different uh, camera kits that you wanna utilize for different reasons, you can then separate everything out and slide in just what you need. Now, if you notice on the sides of this, it has two little Velcro straps on either side. And what that is designed for is so that you can loop it in on the inside of the bag so that it does not move around at all. And all of this camera gear fits into this bag very simply, and it's still comfortable, even though it weighs 36 pounds. So if you're in the market for a bag that is designed for the adventurer, this bag is incredible. It fits so much gear, camping, hiking, camera, it does not matter, it will fit it in there. So if you wanna add this to your gear, go ahead and visit us online at bedfords.com or visit your local store. I'm Luke from Bedford Camera and Video and we'll catch you next time.
Hey, welcome back. Robert Trawick here. Just want to kind of chime in real quick to make sure you guys are still stay in tune. Our next speaker is going to be Matthew Dyson. He's going to be up here in 15 minutes. But I wanted to let you know that one of the door prizes we have is the Westcott FJ80. Did you guys know this? Yeah, it's new. It's brand spanking new. It wasn't on the list before, but it is now. It is now. So we have added the FJ80 from Westcott. Thank you, Brandon, for calling us up and letting us know that we could add this to the door prizes. Now, if you don't know about the door prizes, you want to go to the website, go all the way down to the link. Sean's going to share that inside the live feed in case you don't have that. There's several different ways that you can add to all the entries you have. Now, the software is going to pick it out automatically. And I just found this out. If you're an iPhone user, you can download the app and get some extra votes. But if you're an Android user, you got to work just a little bit harder to get those extra votes. So be sure to follow all of the instructions on there to get those extra votes for these amazing prizes that we're going to be giving away. So if you can't make it into any of the seven stores, we're having a huge sale on products and each store has different tech reps in there available to help you with any questions, answers, or select the great gear that you need for your next photography adventure. Guess what? Bedfords.com is open 24 seven. And we even have a special code until midnight on Sunday. So if you use the code Expo Live, you'll be entered to get some of those discounts on anything you purchase on the website. If you're on our website, you don't see something you're interested in, be sure to pick up the phone and call the stores. They'll be open until 6 p.m. today and tomorrow. So seven stores, three states, we have some place to serve you. And if not, we can hit you on bedfords.com live website. So we have great reps at the, at the Little Rock store. If you guys wanna pop in and see me, I'll be here in between the speakers answering questions, or you can just come have a cup of coffee with me and we can just talk about stories. Matthew's coming up soon, so stay tuned for more Photo Expo Live.
Hey guys, welcome back. Robert Treywick here with Bedford's Photo Expo Live, coming to you from Little Rock, Arkansas. We got a great presenter coming up next, but don't forget to go there and sign up for all of our drawings. Enter to follow us on Instagram, Facebook. There's all these different ways you can get all the great votes so that you can win some amazing door prizes. And don't forget that Bedford's.com is online and it's open 24 seven. If you use the code photo expo, you get part of our sale. People are saying no, so that's not the right code. Expo live. Expo live. See, I was just checking to see if they were actually checking me in the background or not, but they are. Expo live and you can share in the huge sale that we have at all seven stores, three different states, there's always someone at Bedford's to help you get better photography. Now we're going to introduce our next speaker, dear friend of mine. Robert. Robert. What's the code for this hour? Oh, wait, you didn't say any code for this hour. We need a code. We need a code. All right. So the code for this hour is going to be Canon. C-O-N-O-N. -O Canon is the code. The one before was Westcott. Remember Westcott Pro and Canon. It is hard to do this with a live audience, but I'm working through it very well, I think. So now we're going to introduce our next speaker. Matthew Dyson has been involved in photography for over 20 years. He is a Fuji fam, just like I am. Fuji film guys, woohoo! We rule the world. If you're not, that's okay. We still love you if you shoot Canon, which is the key word for this one hour episode. All right, so we love all the different camera brands. Matthew's awesome. During the pandemic, he kind of got locked into his house and rediscovered all the amazing wildlife he has in his backyard, just like I'm sure that you have wildlife in yours. So he's gonna tell us a story on how you can capture amazing bird photography with the tools you have around the house in your backyard as well. Welcome up, Matthew. It's great to see you, bud. Good to be all here. Right. Good to be all here. yours, enjoy. Thank you. And just for you folks at home, I'm going to reiterate that that code for this hour is Canon. However, I'm going to spell it C-A-N-O-N, -N, which is the actual way to spell Canon. But that's all right. Uh, so, hope you guys are doing very well. Uh, like Robert said, my name is Matthew Dyson. I have um, been in the photography industry for about 20 years, and I'm really, really excited to be here today to help you guys learn a little bit more about how to get better bird and just overall wildlife photography right there at home in your backyard. Uh, a little bit about me. <clears throat> uh, again, I have been in the photography industry for right around 20 years now. Much of that time has been spent right here at Bedford Cameron Video. This is where I got my start in photography uh, years and years ago. I started out as a camera salesman, uh, ended up learning a lot, started teaching classes uh, for Bedford's over all genres of photography. Uh, Bedford's gave me the wonderful opportunity to travel around the country. I've been able to uh, go around, teach photo, video techniques all over the country. It's been really, really good. Uh, also, like, like uh, Robert said, over the course of the pandemic, um, I, I really discovered um, a lot of things to do at home because I wanted to stay in with my family. And so I really rediscovered uh, the passion for wildlife photography that I had. And being in the area that I live, I have a lot of bird and wildlife activity. I really started to, to sort of help master some really good techniques on how to get much better bird photography. And hopefully you guys are gonna learn quite a lot today on how to get that as well. Uh, also, I am being told uh, that we do have a storm. By the way, a little off topic here, we do have a storm here in our area. If we lose power, if we blank out, stay with us. We promise we will be right back for that, all right? All right, so let's move on into the lesson itself. Um, the idea of today's lesson is to take your images from just sort of meh to magnificent, right? We want to help you get better shots of your birds and your, and your subjects up close, personal, full of detail, full of vibrant color, instead of having distracted backgrounds, not, you know, not very good detail in the subject, we're going to help you go from, you know, something that's a little, a little more cluttered, where you're not really going to be able to see everything that's going on, to, again, really up close and personal. Regardless of the gear you have, there are ways to do this, and we will break this down as we go forward. 
All right, some of the things that we are going to cover is we are gonna cover gear, we are gonna cover camera settings, we're gonna cover a bit about focusing as well as composition, really good lighting practices, like how to see light and where to find the proper kind of lighting for this type of photography, and then how to attract the birds into your yard. Because again, if you're stuck at home, you're not wanting to get out of the house and you want to bring the wildlife to you, there are some really cool tips and tricks uh, to help you bring those, those uh, subject matter into your backyard for you. Now, the only thing we're not gonna cover is self-conscious subjects, right? If, you're, if your birds and your, and your wildlife don't want to be there, they, they, they get real camera shy, a lot of times there's nothing you can really do about that, but we are gonna talk about all the different things that you can do while they're there. Now, one of the best ways to attract birds to your backyard um, is give them a reason to be there. And I know that that's not really a photography tip, but if you're just hoping to go out into your yard and expect the animals that you want to shoot to be there, it's not really gonna be the way it happens. So we want to do some research on the animals that you want to attract to your yard and bring in the things that are going to attract them. So with the flora, right, the plant life, you want to find native plants that are going to attract your native birds. So for example, cedar wax wings and robins, they love a plant called choke cherry. Plant some of that around, whether it's planting it in your yard or having you know, container plants placed around. It doesn't really matter as long as you're planting the right kind of flora for those animals to come in. Make sure that they have a solid water source, right? Put bird baths or little fountains or something in your yard so that your yard is the place that those animals want to go in order to be in that area. Don't let it be the neighbor's house. Try to make your area as bird friendly as possible. Um, seeds, seeds seems like a pretty obvious one, but uh, keep in mind that not all seeds are created equally. Again, do some research on your own to find out what kind of animals and wildlife you wanna bring in. Figure out the seeds that you wanna have. And finally, uh, how to attract birds is when you get all of these things figured out, right? Once you get the, the right plant life, once you get the right seeds, the bird feeders, everything up and about, make sure that you are um, adding a perch in the area of the bird feeder, all right? And now down here, notice that I've put, try to use natural looking perches. And we'll get into more of the aesthetics with that here in a moment. But so you can actually see in this photograph where this uh, black capped chickadee is sitting on this small perch. Now, this little branch is not actually growing on the tree. I have actually roped this and tied this onto a branch that has a lot more greenery on it. And so when the birds would land on it, I couldn't see the bird. But a little thing about birds is that they want to land on a perch um, before they go down for their food source, all right? So if you will pay attention to the, the activity of the animals, birds will typically fly in, they'll land on some sort of a perch to look around, check their surroundings for predators, for what they perceive as, as dangerous things, and then they will go on down to the feeder. So if you can create a natural looking perch somewhere in the immediate vicinity above your bird feeders, and then focus on that area, you're, you know that you're gonna get much better shots of that wildlife in a much more natural looking setting, which is going to do wonders for the quality of your photograph. Now let's talk about those feeders, right? Now, this is a course on how to get better bird photography, right? Better backyard wildlife images. We want to try to avoid shots like this which means we need to try to avoid really false looking or fake looking or store-bought looking feeders, all right? And the reason is, as you will notice this feeder right here, you've got a nice little bird in the shot, but here you've got this big, big bird feeder that is extremely distracting. It's bright, it's blue, it's, it's pulling your attention away from the bird, and so you don't want to do this, all right? Instead, try to create natural looking feeders in your area that are going to give a more in the wild or natural look to your shots, all right? So this here is just a piece of firewood that I had on the side of the house. 
I took a hatchet and a carving knife and dug out a trench here in the top of the, of the log, attached it to a pole, and that is one of the bird feeders in my backyard. Now that, you will notice, is way less distracting than this, this big, bright, blue, plastic thing that is very, very distracting in your shot. Here, you're getting a lot more attention to detail on the bird itself, which is going to cause your audience who is looking at your subjects and looking at your photographs to really focus in on what you want them to be as a subject, all right? So again, the look of the feeder is going to go a long way to improving your images overall with your bird photography. Now, I wanna teach you a little bit about how you can attract birds digitally, right? Now, it seems a little bit weird, like you're going outside to be in nature, what would you need to do digitally in order to attract these birds? Well, this app here is my favorite app for bird photography, okay? It is called Merlin Bird ID. It is a free app and it is extremely easy to use. Now, how it's going to help you attract birds is you want to download the app. You're going to get a small wireless Bluetooth speaker, just a small pocket-sized portable speaker. Connect your phone to this and then open the app and have fun because this app is going to help you attract birds into your yard, okay? And I'm gonna kind of talk you through how to work the app so that you don't get it and get confused on how to do it. So again, it's a free app. Download this, this Merlin Bird ID. Once you download it, you are going to click this little hamburger menu up in the top left-hand corner of the app, okay? Once you've clicked that, you will then, it'll open up this page and you're going to go to something called Explore Birds, all right? Once you've clicked Explore Birds, you're just gonna find the bird of your choice, all right? So in this one, we pick the indigo bunting, all right? You'll click on the bird that you want it will bring up a photo of the bird. It will bring up some really cool information about that species, which is good because it helps teach you a little bit more about the mannerisms and what to expect. Finally, at the bottom, it's going to have an icon called sounds. Once you go into the sounds icon, it's gonna give you a list of the bird calls for that bird. When you hit the play button on that, it will automatically start playing sounds from that animal. Now, if you have, say, a pile of brush or a pile of twigs or, or, you know, a burn pile or whatever in your yard, you can place this little small Bluetooth speaker in that area, start to play the sounds of these birds in hopes to attract that type of bird to that specific area of your yard because they'll fly in there looking for the other bird, right, looking for who is making that noise, and you know at that point roughly where the bird is going to land, and that's going to give you a huge huge advantage um, in trying to track down the animal to make sure that you get the shot that you're looking for. Now, we've talked a little bit about birds and how to attract those into your yard. I wanna give you one final cool tip on how to attract an animal. The best way to attract squirrels to your backyard, super simple, all you gotta do is try to attract birds. Once you try to attract birds into your backyard, Squirrels are gonna be there. You're never really gonna have a hard time trying to get good images of those. The hardest part is going to be keeping them out of the feeders um, and, and, and scaring the birds away. So be careful with that. And if you come up with any really great tips on how to keep the squirrels out, definitely let us know because that's something we would all like to learn. Okay, so we are gonna talk about different lighting practices. All right, now in photography, there are a lot of important aspects, but light is definitely the most important one. If you don't have the right light, you're not gonna get the shot, all right? Lighting is absolutely crucial for photographers. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what types of light to shoot in to get certain types of pictures of your wildlife. Now, the best overall practice uh, to get the most vibrant shots of birds is to point the shadow of you at the bird, right? Shoot toward your shadow. And what that means is that's gonna put the sun at your back. Well, if the sun is at your back, the sh your shadow's going forward, then the sun is gonna be hitting the front of the bird and completely illuminating it, right? You're going to get bright, vibrant color, sharp detail, 
and it's just going to give you a good, clean, crisp image, all right? So point your shadow at the bird whenever possible to help ensure bright, vibrant colors. Bright, direct light is also gonna be very beneficial for uh, capturing birds in flight, all right? Um, so with shots like this here, so like the goose coming in on the water, Fairly easy to do, especially in bright light, because larger birds like that have a slower movement, right? They don't fly and move their wings nearly as fast as small, small dainty animals do. So they're a little easier to capture. But for shots like this, we got a little bit of soft here, right? We weren't able to capture it quite as, as crisp as we necessarily would want it to. But again, that just goes to show how important light is. We need to have a maximum amount of light possible in order to capture images of birds in flight. If you want a softer, more subdued tone with more, uh, more gentle contrast in your images, one thing that you can do is shoot for either early in the morning or very late in the afternoon, all right? That's going to be very, very soft lighting. The key here is that you're not going to be aiming for birds in flight at this point. You're going to be uh, going for the images of the birds being stationary, being on their perches, being on their feeders, all right? Now, between the two of super early morning or super late afternoon, when the light is low and it's long and soft, Morning tends to be best because with this kind of photography, late in the afternoon, especially now during the middle of summer, uh, late afternoon, you've got a lot of heat starting to rise up off of the pavement and, and off of like maybe your back deck or things like that. And sometimes you can get some heat shimmer in, your, in, your, in the air and some, some heat pollution there that can create a little softness to your image that you may not want to, to have. So shooting super early in the morning is going to be the best and that's really great for this type of photography because that is when the birds are the most active, okay? The birds are gonna be the most active first thing in the morning and that early morning light is gonna be really, really good for capturing these soft, subtle images like this. Uh-oh. We transferred this slideshow over to another computer and it's not keeping quite all of my font, but I will let you know. This slide is supposed to say, now let's talk about composition. So we're going to start to talk about composition a little bit, which is basically just how you see your subjects, uh, how you frame and place your subject within the image to create a more compelling story for your audience. So first off, we're gonna talk about the rule of thirds, okay? Now, first and foremost, the rule of thirds is not a concrete rule. Okay? It's not something that you have to do, but it is a really good way to start and a good place to start when you're trying to capture and create a much more interesting photograph for your audience. All right. Now, the idea behind the rule of thirds is to imagine that there is a tic-tac-toe board in your viewfinder. All right. Imagine that there is a tic-tac-toe board either in the viewfinder or on the back LCD screen of your camera. And the cool thing is that in most cameras today, that actually is easy to achieve. Most of these cameras in the menu somewhere are going to have a grid or a display option that will give you these grids inside your camera. And obviously these aren't going to show up on your photo, but what they are going to do is they are going to allow you to keep your levels, like your horizons and your vertical lines, very, very straight, which is going to help you not have to do nearly as much post-processing, all right? It's also going to help you place your subject you see where these circles are. So these are points of interest. And then you've also got the third horizontals and the third verticals. So let's talk a little bit about this. So we've got a blue jay on a privacy fence, right? Notice that it is not dead center. If we have all of our pictures with the animal or Uncle Bob or whoever dead center in the frame with a bunch of nothing over here and a bunch of nothing over here, that creates boredom in your photos, and it means that all of your photos just sort of look the same. There's no movement or flow to them. So placing the bird here puts the bird itself directly on that, that, third, um, that third vertical there, and it is going to give you a much more pleasing photo. Another really interesting thing about this is that if you are capturing photos for, say, a newsletter, 
or a magazine or a blog post or whatever. You've got all of this area now that is unencumbered that you can have your font or your text or your stories about that animal, okay? Which is a really, really good thing to have, especially for things like publications. This little chipmunk that we found, um, same kind of deal. You know, he is composed completely with rule of thirds in mind. His body is right here across that bottom line. His tail takes up this whole far right hand side of the frame. And then you've got some soft area back here that is just dedicated to sort of color and texture, keeping your focus here on the subject at hand. So again, rule of thirds, not a rule, but definitely a great place to start for, um, for composing your images, okay? But before you get too worried about finding that right composition in the field, remember that if it's, if it's time sensitive, if you don't think that your animal or your subject is going to stay still for very long, capture the photo as best you can and then crop later and edit for the composition. So the image on the left and the image on the right are the exact same photo, they're the exact same image. The image on the right, I have just cropped in and then created that rule of third because this bird I noticed was flying in and getting a seat and flying out fast. He wasn't giving me much time. So instead of worrying about the composition at the time of the capture, I just shot for the image and then edited for the composition. Keep in mind though, you don't wanna to shoot too wide and far away because the more you have to crop, the more damage you're gonna to do to the file ultimately. All right, so be a little careful with that. Now, let's talk a little bit about line of sight. All right, so line of sight in a photo is basically just the idea that we are going to follow the subject's view. So the subject is here, they're looking this direction, they're going to be looking through the frame, all right? That is a good, a good place to, to have your subject because again, we want to watch and look through the frame. If the subject is here and the subject is immediately to this side and looking this direction, all of this just sort of becomes useless for the photo, okay? Now, it's a personal preference and photography is an art, so by all means, do what you want, but the, the general rule for that is you want to make sure that the subject is looking through the frame, not immediately out of it, because it crowds that subject. It crowds the, the, the air around them and creates a lot of negative space here in the backside. One last thing about composition is you've got to watch your background, right? With bird photography, it's easy to get so focused on the animal that you're, you're so worried about capturing the right shot that you don't think about what's going on in the background of the frame. So like here, we've got a decent little shot of the bird. We could crop in some, but we're still going to have some siding lines. We're still going to have a lot of stuff. As it is, you've got windows and lights and a door. There's just a lot going on. And it's a very, very distracting image that takes away from the subject itself. Instead, try to move or turn your, your body or your camera to an area that's going to create a very soft and subtle background, something that's not going to, again, distract or take away from that bird, from that animal, all right? That's gonna be one of the most crucial things. And again, everybody's guilty of it. I've been shooting forever, it seems like now, and I'm still occasionally will capture an image, think, oh, this is the one, look at the camera and then realize, oh, there's, there's trash cans in the back or there's, you know, uh, a neighbor was walking through the frame and I just didn't notice it. So just make sure that you try to, to watch the background anytime that you can. Um, and then with watching the background, if you can't change the camera angle to move those, those distracting elements, do everything that you can to blur that background blur the background out and create it to where it's really, really soft, that is going to help remove some of those distractions, right? Well, that may be easier said than done if you're not familiar with how to do that, right? So how do we blur the background? Well, without getting into any of the technical stuff yet, without getting into any of the camera settings, one of the, the easiest methods for blurring the background 
is going to be to just use a strong telephoto lens and make sure that you're shooting in an area where there's a lot of space behind the subject. All right, so if you are using, say, a 100 to 400 lens, 400 millimeter lens, really strong telephoto, zoom in, focus on the bird, you've zoomed in, it creates compression. Well, if there's, you know, 20, 30, 40 yards behind that bird, that background as it comes to the subject is going to blur out, right? So even without having to know anything technical about your camera's exposure settings or, you know, your, your meter readings or any of that, using a long telephoto lens and just zooming in really tight on the subject will help you blur the background out considerably, which will help you minimize the distractions in the background. However, there are camera settings that are going to be crucial for helping you maximize that on a much more consistent basis, all right? So some of the best settings for backyard photography are if you're not comfortable with completely full manual on your camera, is to tap into the aperture priority mode, all right? The aperture priority mode is a mode on your camera where you are able to control what is known as the aperture of the lens, which we'll get into here in just a moment. And then the camera will, will sort of help take care of some of the other stuff so that you're not having to worry about everything manual, but you do have more control over your, your look, the look of your photos. So aperture priority mode is um, designated by either an A or an AV on most all of the cameras out there. Um, Robert did mention that I'm a Fuji shooter, and so Fuji cameras, if anybody is shooting Fuji out there, you know the layout of those cameras is a little different. So you may have to do a little digging on your camera to figure out how to access just that aperture priority mode. But on the vast majority of cameras out there, it's either gonna be an A or an AV on the command dial, okay? Now, why do we wanna use aperture priority? Again, it's fast and it's wicked easy to use, okay? Two, it takes care of the shutter speed for you. So you're gonna control the aperture, which again, we'll get into here in a moment, which is going to help you with the blurry background. And then the camera is gonna take care of the shutter speed while keeping a good exposure, right? So it's fast, it's easy to use, and it takes care of half of the equation for you. This, because it takes care of that stuff for you, it allows you to focus more on your subject matter, making sure that you are getting the shot the way that you want it. So what is aperture? I keep saying go to the aperture mode and, and, and have it you know, be where you set the aperture. Well, what is that? Well, the aperture is just the iris inside the lens barrel, right? It's, it's like the pupil of your eye. It opens and closes to allow different amounts of light to come in. Now, you will notice here, this same lens all the way through, we've got an F1.8. So a small F number is a big opening. Move down here, you've got F22. A larger F number is a small opening, all right? So what does this mean to you? Well, uh, oh, and real quick, I do wanna make a side note that the terms aperture and F-stop, while they're technically slightly different, for most layman uh, terms in photography, most of the time when you're talking to people, they're gonna use aperture and f-stop as interchangeable terms. So if you hear me say the word aperture quite a lot, and then you read a blog post or a magazine or have a different photo instructor, and they start using the term f-stop, we're, we're talking about the same thing, okay? That's a very important thing for you to know for the vo vocabulary for, for your photography lessons. So what this means here is, again, small number, big opening. That means more light. Smaller number equals more light coming in through the camera. Well, more light coming in through the camera means the camera has more light to work with. You're going to get faster shutter speeds, which is going to help you freeze the action of those birds in movement. Okay? Also, the smaller number equals a more blurry background. So when you have a wider open aperture, you're going to also help blur the background more. That's just one of the benefits and features of those low aperture numbers. But we have to keep in, keep in mind and take note that not all lenses are created equal, okay? Not all lenses are going to be able to give you that 1.8 aperture. 
So here we have an 85 millimeter 1.8 lens. You'll notice on your lens somewhere, maybe it's on the front of the lens barrel or maybe it's uh, down on the, the, towards the bottom of the body of the lens. You're gonna have your focal length and then you're going to have some, some numbers here. And those numbers are going to tell you what the aperture range on that lens is. So if you put your lens on and you go to the aperture priority mode and you try to bring that F number down to the 1.8 and it's not going there, your camera isn't messed up, your lens isn't messed up, it's just that not all lenses are created equal, all right? So, what we have is here. This is how you're gonna read what is known as that variable aperture, because again, you see this one goes to 1.8, this one is 3.5 to 5.6, well, well, what does that mean? That basically means that here, at 28 millimeter, oh, and again, transferring this over to the different computer, we are losing some of our font, uh, at 28, which is to be right here, 28, the widest open aperture you can get is a 3.5. But when you zoom out to 300, the widest open aperture you can get is a 5.6. That doesn't mean that those are the only numbers you can use, but at each individual focal length from the widest to the most telephoto, those, those numbers that are listed on your lens, that's just the smallest F number you'll be able to get at that range, okay? So again, Let's not get too caught up about all this. I just want you to know that if you're out shooting, put it to the aperture priority mode, set it to the lowest aperture number possible, and that will help you to get a blurry, blurry background. And uh, it will also let in the most light, giving you a good, fast, clean shutter speed. Now with aperture priority mode, the camera is going to look at the scene and it is going to try to create what it believes is a proper exposure for you, okay? And in most situations with today's technology, it does a really good job. But say you have a really bright background or a really backlit subject, that exposure may not be exactly what you think it's going to be. Well, without having to get into uh, full manual on your camera still, one of the things you can do is while you're in aperture priority mode, because if you're in aperture priority, regardless of where you set the aperture, the brightness of the picture is going to stay the same. And the reason is, is as you adjust the aperture, it controls the shutter speed to constantly compensate and create the brightness to be the same all the time. All right. So what you can do instead is in aperture priority mode, research your camera and figure out where the exposure compensation mode is on your camera. Okay, on most cameras, it's going to be signified by a little plus minus um, button. On the Fujis, it's literally just a dial that says plus one, two, and three, or minus one, two, and three. But what this does is as you make the adjustment, say you pull it over two plus, that's going to brighten the entire image. So the next time you pull the shutter down, you're going to get a brighter shot. Or if you pull it down to the negative, then the next time you shoot, it's going to get a darker shot. The camera is still doing most of the work, but you're still able to tweak that to make sure that you're getting the shots you want. So you capture an image of the bird, you review it on the back LCD screen. If it's a little too dark or it's a little too bright, you go into your exposure compensation mode, make the adjustment, and then start shooting from there. So shutter speed. What is that? I keep talking about you're in aperture priority mode. You set the aperture, the camera sets the shutter speed. Well, the shutter speed is just how fast the camera takes an image. In aperture priority mode, the camera sets that for you. Now, images like this here, uh, you definitely need to have a minimum, minimum of a 250th of a second, preferably much faster, in order to freeze, freeze birds in motion like this here. So on the back of your camera, Whenever you are pressing the shutter release button, okay, which will be right here on the front of the camera, that is going to wake up the entire meter. Okay? When it wakes up the metering system in your camera, this number here, so here you have an F 5.6, so that's gonna be your aperture. When you wake that up, it should show you what the shutter speed is going to do in your camera. Right? It's going to tell you, hey, my shutter speed is going to be 1 over 125, or 1 over 200, or 1 over 1,000, or whatever it may be, okay? It's going to be displayed there on the left-hand side. 
It's best for you to have a shutter speed of at least a 500th of a second. Like I said here at 250th, bare minimum, because we still had some soft blur here in the wings. 500th of a second or faster is gonna help, the, help ensure that you're freezing those birds in motion, that you're freezing those subjects, right? Because even when they're still, they're not always still, okay? Which is again, why very fast shutter speeds are super important. Um, like this bird here, the blue bird, it was perched on the, the, the wires of the bird feeder and then it just decided to start flapping its wings. And because I had some really fast shutter speeds, I was able to get this really cool shot of its wings fully exposed, okay? So fast shutter speeds are crucial for backyard wildlife photography. So if at all possible, like I said, 500 minimum, uh, but 2,000th of a second or greater if you can at all do it. That is going to ensure that you get really crisp, crisp, clean, vibrant wings, totally frozen, and not this down here, which is just a blurry mess, okay? And that was shot, again, at a 250th of a second of the bird flying away from the feeder. Not a good image. Shutter speed was just too slow. So you're in aperture priority mode. You adjust the aperture the camera adjusts the shutter speed for you. I've already said that with that aperture, the lowest F number possible is going to give you the fastest shutter speed possible. Well, what if that shutter speed is not fast enough? And what if your shutter or your, your aperture is open as far as you can get it, but you still need a faster shutter speed? Well, the one thing that you can do is you can raise your ISO, all right? What is ISO? ISO is the measure of the digital sensor's sensitivity to light. It's how sensitive is it to light. If it's very, very sensitive to light, then it doesn't want it in there very long. It's gonna create a really fast shutter speed, right? It's the equivalent to film speed for any of you guys out there that have shot film or maybe you still do shoot film as a hobby some. Uh, remember that lower ISO numbers require a lot of light. If it requires a lot of light and the light is kind of kind of dim, it's going to drag that shutter speed a bit slower, okay? Well, higher sensitivity or at higher ISO, it can shoot fast scenes with a lot less light. Well, people say, well, if that ISO is really high and it can shoot fast scenes in really low light, why don't I shoot high ISOs all the time? And the reason for that is this right here. On the right hand side, you've got high ISO. You see it's, it's very pixely, very digital noise. Uh, that's what that's called is digital. It's almost like a static electricity running through the image. Here on the left, this is what the image looks like at low ISO. So taking an image with the lowest ISO possible will give you the cleanest picture, but the slower shutter speed. Raising that ISO is going to give you faster shutter speeds you run the risk of introducing noise, but don't be scared of this, okay? This is a extreme example, all right? Most cameras today can shoot shutter, I'm sorry, uh, ISOs up to 3200 and still maintain incredible image integrity and incredible clarity, okay? A lot of people are afraid to take their ISO too high because they're afraid it's going to introduce too much noise, um, just stay away from like the 12,800 range uh, on your camera. Something as high as the, 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 the camera's ISO will go on that camera is not gonna be good. But staying in that 3,200 to 1,600 range is gonna be totally fine for the cleanliness of your image. And that high ISO is going to help you really speed up those images, helping you capture super good pictures of the birds in motion, all right? This, again, sadly, was supposed to give you the, the range of ISO here, but we transferred everything over to Robert Trawick, our MC, his laptop, and it's not showing it, so I'm totally gonna blame him for that technical malfunction. So again, the moral of the story, use the absolute lowest ISO possible for the situation. But if the situation requires motion and a lot of ISO, 
Don't be scared to raise it up. Just don't crank it up to the highest possible. Now, we are going to look at the continuous fire mode. All right. So with the continuous fire mode, your cameras somewhere on them are going to have either a drive menu option or they will have a drive button on the outside of the camera. All right. This drive button is how fast does the camera take from the first picture to the second picture to the third. Boom, 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 boom. You pull the shutter, rapid fire. That's continuous fire mode, right? Or your continuous drive. Birds move fast. That's, that's just what they do. Birds move quick. And you have a much, much better of getting the shot if you're shooting that continuous fire drive. Now, you obviously are not going to keep them all. Right? You may shoot a burst of 10 or 12 pictures. You need to keep the one that is the gem out of that whole bunch. Okay, um, You will need to be aware of your camera's buffer. Well, what does that mean? Well, a camera, when a camera takes a photo, it takes a photo to a buffer, and then that buffer feeds it to the memory card. The memory card is not immediately capturing the images. Boom, 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 one right after the other. It's caught on a buffer in the camera, then the buffer feeds it to the card. So if you find that your camera is going click, 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 pause, pause, click, pause, click, and it's not continuously shooting, then chances are your memory card is too slow. It's not a fast enough memory card to retrieve the data off of that buffer. So that just means that you may need to upgrade your memory card. All right. So when you come into Bedford's and you're looking around or you're shopping online at bedfords.com and you're looking around at memory cards and you say, well, there's two 64 gig cards. One of them is $30 less than the other one. Why would I ever spend $30 here when I don't have to and I can get the same card here? Just because they're the same capacity doesn't mean that they have the same performance. And that performance has to do with how fast is that data being able to be written onto that card the faster it can be written onto that card, the faster the camera's buffer is empty and the camera can just continuously pop off shots and you're going to stand a much better chance of getting good, crisp action shots, whether it's sports, wildlife, what, whatever, the, the, whatever the subject may be, faster memory cards are going to help your camera retrieve images faster, which is gonna help you become a better photographer. And again, with continuous fire mode, it's not just used for flight. Um, it's just used for some of these little whimsical moments because it's not often that the bird is going to look right at you, right? A lot of times if the bird has seen you and noticed you and it looks at you, it's already flown away. It, it doesn't want any part of that. It, it thinks you're a big scary thing. And so it's gonna fly off. But occasionally if you're popping off rapid shots and the bird looks around to see you right before it flies, you're going to be able to capture a nice, cute little whimsical moment for that, that, that wildlife, for that bird. And that's, again, something that you're going to be a lot more hard pressed to do to try to capture it at the moment that it happens. All right. So continuous fire mode is absolutely crucial for solid and consistent wildlife photography. So let's talk here um, about focusing. Uh, let's look at how and when and where to focus on your subjects um, in order to, to really get the sharpest images possible. Now on your cameras, on most lenses today, you are going to have this here. You're going to have a little manual focus, autofocus switch. Now sometimes it's just on the camera body, but in many situations today, it's actually on the lens barrel itself. Uh, so just pay attention to that. Now, most of the time, the vast, vast majority of the time, we are going to use autofocus just to sort of track the birds, but there is a, um, there is a time and a place for manual focus as well, all right? So we're, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So you have a couple of different options here. Um, this top option is single fire. I'm sorry, not single fire, single focus. So within your camera's autofocus system, you're going to have, for most all the brands out there, you're going to have AFA, AFS, and AFC, all right? On Canon, um, it's called a little different. The AF single, the single focus is called one shot, and the continuous focus is called AI servo, okay? So what's happening here is for wildlife that is very, very stationary that you know is going to be sitting still for quite some time, AFS is wonderful. 
it's AF single, right? Or for cannon shooters, one shot, right? What that is, is you press halfway down on your shutter button, it locks the focus and you take pictures and it doesn't constantly try to readjust the focus. But for birds in flight, AFS really isn't gonna do you much good. You need the camera to constantly be tracking and moving and, and refocusing on that subject to get as many clean shots as possible. Now, does that mean that all of the shots are going to be good and clean? No, but it stands a much better chance of getting more images in focus if you are using the continuous fire mode. Now, the AFA, which is called AF Auto on most cameras and on um, Canon, it's called AI Focus. Those are uh, uh, modes that I wouldn't use. Um, they, what it does is it tries to, to look at both of these images. It tries to say, well, I think it's this or I think it's this, and it's going to try to do that for you. Um, and it almost always chooses poorly, which is why I would not use that mode at all. So again, uh, with Canon, you have single shot that is called uh, one shot and continuous is called AI servo. Most everybody else is just AFS or AFC. Um, these are gonna be the focus points inside your camera, all right? Now your camera is going to give you the ability to either select the autofocus point yourself or to let the camera choose for you. Never let the camera choose for you, okay? Especially with this type of photography. Now, if you're in the auto mode, if you're shooting auto or any of the auto presets, you don't have a choice. You have to let the camera choose for you. But once you go into that aperture priority mode, like we've been talking about, you have the ability to select which autofocus point you use, which is gonna be crucial for tracking your subject. All right, so the idea here would be to designate and keep a specific autofocus point or group of points selected throughout your venture here, all right? So like with this here, I would recommend shooting the center single autofocus point and then try to track your subject, moving your camera around and keep that subject in focus. And then again, we can crop later for the composition but it's easier to track a bird if you're, instead of trying to worry about, well, let me keep the rule of thirds and all that while I'm moving, just keep it in the center of the frame and then we'll crop to the, to the composition later. Now, designating and keeping a specific autofocus point works especially well whenever you are dealing with a camera that has multiple focus points or, or a lot of focus points. So like this camera here had nine. This autofocusing system has nine focus points. Well, it's easy to keep just a small center point focus, but if you have a camera that has substantially more focus points, then instead of just using one, you can use a cluster in the center, and that is going to spread more across your subject, helping you keep that subject in focus, because if they accidentally move and pop off of that center autofocus point, that larger cluster is really gonna be able to, to continue to pick up that movement and keep the subject in focus the entire time. And then you'll end up with, again, much more crisp focus on your subjects. Now, if you are using um, some of the stronger telephoto lenses that are out there, um, some of those lenses are going to offer what is called a limiter switch, right? And that is going to be here on the side of the camera and generally it will say full and then over here it will give you a small focusing range all right when we're dealing with birds and wildlife most of the time we do not want to allow it to have full range of focus now what this means is that in set to full if the camera is capable of focusing a foot in front of you out to infinity that's where it will be allowed to hunt for the subject but with birds and wildlife a lot of times they're sitting on a branch and you may have other branches and twigs and, and things moving with the wind and blowing in front of you. You don't want the, the lens to adjust the focus and pull away from the subject and go on to the distracting elements. So instead, you're going to limit that focus to be three meters to infinity or whatever the options are on your particular lens. That means that anything that crosses closer to you in front of that focus point, it's not going to distract the focusing system away from your bird, okay? Or away from your wildlife. Now, manual focus. Now, 
it's, it's hard to think about manually focusing and capturing birds, but it's definitely something that's not only doable, but it's actually recommended in some situations, all right? So these two shots here, we knew exactly where the wildlife was gonna go. In the first shot, we set up a bluebird box. We knew that the family had a nest there, so we knew that was exactly where the birds were going to go. So we set the camera up on a tripod, which is vital for this type of shooting. Make sure that if you're using manual focus that you're absolutely on a tripod, but you're gonna focus on the, the bird box or focus on the bird feeder where you know the wildlife is gonna come in. You focus there, autofocus is good, autofocus there, switch it to manual focus, and then let go of your camera. Then as the animals start to come in, when you depress the shutter button, the camera's not gonna try to start readjusting focus. The focusing system is dead at that point, but it's already pre-locked where you needed it to be. Then as you see the animals come in, using that continuous fire mode that we talked about earlier, you just start, you, you press the shutter and you're gonna get a rapid succession of photos. That's gonna help you get images of the wildlife in action and full of movement and you're gonna have a lot more uh, creativity in your photos than them just sitting still because you had to wait and capture it after they landed or you were sweeping your camera too fast and trying to track them, okay? So again, a tripod, pre-focus with your autofocus system and then switch it to manual focus. And then as you see the animal come in, start firing early and that will give you the, the movement and fluidity that you want in your photo. Um, again, just another example of this right here. You want to have uh, the continuous fire mode activated, start taking images as the animal starts coming in, and this is just another example of that. Pre-focusing, um, this was a cool little day. This bird, we were on our back deck. Bird had a nest up in the, the eaves of our deck. All day long, it would fly out, capture bugs, come in, land on this exact same spot on the deck railing, look at us, and then fly up to the nest. It kept landing there to make sure that we weren't a threat, would fly up. I saw that it was continuously moving there, so while it was out hunting, I grabbed my camera, set it up and focused, and then as it landed there, it just continually looked right into the camera. So it's fun to observe your wildlife, figure out some of their habits, and then that's where you can go to start using this manual focus technique, and you'll get some really cool up close and personal uh, shots of your wildlife. So let's talk a little bit about gear and tips on how to use this gear and maybe how to get images if you don't have some of the big gear like this. So generally, it is very good to have a very long telephoto lens, right? A 70 to 300, 100 to 400, 150 to 600, something that's going to allow you to zoom into your subject without getting right in their personal space, all right? For those of you that are looking around, trying to find something, maybe you're, you're not ready to pull the trigger on some of the, the lenses that are out there, Tamron and Sigma both offer incredible options with their 150 to 600 and they are beautiful, beautiful lenses, very good for this type of photography and great for someone just getting into the, the birding and wildlife stuff. So again, the benefits of a long lens, you get up close and personal with your subjects from a distance. You're not scaring them, right? And it doesn't just have to be birds and things that are going to notice you quickly. It can even be the smaller stuff in your backyard. Um, a lot of people, attribute this kind of image to a macro lens where you have to get right down on top of your subject to get the detail. But the cool thing about these telephoto lenses is they typically have great focusing ranges and you're able to, again, get right up close and personal with the subject without scaring it away and still get really good detail. Also, notice that really super blurry background. We talked earlier about when you use a long telephoto lens and you zoom way into your subject, it's going to help blur that background that's gonna help create a much less, distract, less distracting area back there, which makes your subject really pop and scream in the image. Gimbal heads. Um, Bedford Camera offers a really good line of gimbal heads from ProMaster that are phenomenal. 
Uh, and what a gimbal head does is it allows you to move the camera vertically and horizontally while keeping the camera really balanced over the head of the tripod, which creates a lot more ability to move left, right, up and down and sort of in you know a curved pattern, giving you the ability to track these animals much, much easier than you would with a traditional uh, ball head or a three-way pan uh, landscape head. These gimbal heads are absolutely phenomenal and they're easy to use without having to constantly adjust the knobs and dials that are on the, on the, the machine itself. So really, really good for long, heavy telephoto lenses for wildlife photography. Now, what if you don't have a long lens? Right? What if you're at home right now and you've got a lot of bird activity in your backyard and you don't have a chance to get to the store right away to pick up one of these big cool lenses? Well, a wireless remote, if you have a wireless remote, is an awesome option. And if not, even the Wi-Fi feature on your camera. In a lot of situations uh, with most of today's cameras, you have the Wi-Fi features, which means that you can connect it uh, wirelessly to your cell phone and use your phone as a wireless remote. The cool thing about the wireless remote option on your phone is on your phone's LCD screen, you're going to see real time exactly what the, the camera sees. What I like more about the wireless remote is the connection is more stable, it's more reliable. Uh, not to say that the Wi-Fi is bad, but if you do lose that connection, you have to physically go out to the camera and get it reset, where a wireless remote, you don't have to have that. But with this image here, these little squirrels, what I did, as you saw here, I just had a small camera set up on a small tripod. We threw out some feed, we threw out some corn, and then it was super cold outside. So my kids and I went in the house with the little wireless remote. And then as the animals came up right in front of the camera to eat the seed, we just started firing off the images. And that gave us some really cool up close and personal shots with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. Just a standard kit lens allowed for us to get telephoto look because we were able to get right up in the subject space because they were coming to us at that point, all right? With the subject coming straight to us at that point, that allows, again, for really good crisp detail. And because we weren't there behind the camera, we were in the house, the animals weren't scared of the, of the camera at all and we were really able to get a lot of really good detail. And there you go. That's it. Those are some of the tips that I have for how to really create amazing wildlife photography in your backyard, whether you're using big long telephoto lenses or the short lenses that you just already have available. Make sure that you're using that autofocus system that we talked about, composition that we talked about, the whole nine yards. I appreciate your time and uh, let's hand this back over to Mr. Robert Trawick. Do you have time for questions? Absolutely I do. Yeah, questions away. Do you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen? I thought they had already had those pulled up. Uh, yeah, seriously, if you do, if you have any questions at all about what we talked about, maybe something that I didn't talk about that you would like to know and whether it would be helpful for your, your birding and wildlife photography, go ahead and uh, drop that in now in the chat and they will, uh, they will get those to us and let me know. Well, since I'm right here, yeah. you, I'd love to know, what is your favorite lens to shoot wildlife? Uh, my favorite lens to shoot wildlife, there's a couple. One of them is uh, the 100 to 400 from Fuji. It is my all time favorite lens for the big wildlife stuff, especially the image that I had of like the little butterfly on the flower, being able to get the, even those small shots. But um, honestly, I also really like using my 16 to 55. Um, so I have a 16 to 55 2.8. Uh, Images like this right here are able to be captured again with those wider angle lenses because again, you put those on the, the tripod, you get your wireless receiver and your, your, your wireless remote, get them pulled up and then the 16 to 55 is really, really nice. It's a good cool portrait lens, but it can also be a nice wide lens that can give you a lot of the landscape and stuff in the background. So 100 to 400 and the 16 to 55. 
Well, I really love your wildlife photography. It's pretty awesome. Where can the listeners find you at if we want to continue following all of your adventures in your backyard? Oh, we are actually working on starting a YouTube channel uh, that will be called Dyson Creative Photography. That will be our, our YouTube channel. Um, and then also you can check me out on the web at DysonCreativePhotography.com and on Facebook as well. When you're taking photographs in the backyard, have you ever used any like sound triggers or motion triggers to trigger the camera to get the object shot? I have not uh, used sound triggers to get the shot, but uh, I don't know if you saw earlier, but I do use sound uh, to draw the animals in. There is an, an app called Merlin Bird ID that we, uh, that we use that Merlin Bird ID will, uh, again, we talked about it, it will give you the bird sounds and allow you to draw those birds in. That has been one of the coolest things that I have found that I have used. I have been able to draw in birds that I knew were in my region, but I hadn't actually seen in my backyard. Uh, and being able to use that Merlin ID app with the wireless Bluetooth speaker did wonders for being able to bring in birds that weren't normally right there in my area. Well, that's awesome. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. That right. was Matthew Dyson. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. That was amazing. All right. We appreciate Everybody it. Everybody loves it. It was good mm -hmm. seeing him. And you can always find him at a lot of the Bedford events we have. Matthew Dyson's amazing. Follow him on Instagram. Follow him on Facebook. And check out his YouTube channel. All right, folks. We're going to have another speaker. Let me just double check my notes. Three o'clock sharp. We're going to have Ryan Brown Techniques for Epic Landscape Photography. Now, the stores are open today and tomorrow until 6 p.m. If you want to come in and see some of our show specials, but those still are available online at bedfords.com if you use the code EXPO LIVE. Those show specials will be available online until 12 o'clock midnight Central Standard Time on the website only. Don't forget, seven locations will be open today and tomorrow until 6 p.m. So if you want to see some of the reps, check out the great equipment or even get your questions answered by the fine staff at Bedford's Camera, please stop by your local store. We'll see you guys at 3 p.m.
My name is Alina Rudia. I'm a photographer and visual storyteller. So here in Porto, I've been testing the new 7200. Even though it's a telelens, it is very versatile and I was able to capture a variety of scenes with it around Porto. It's great for creating density in urban photography, architecture or in landscape. Um, I'm not usually uh, very into the technical part of photography, but uh, in this case I really noticed uh, the, the sharpness of the photograph and the 200 millimeter focal length, it creates this beautiful bouquet. I think it will become my go-to lens and it will also make my luggage much lighter and me much happier. Mac Group, or Mamiya America Corp, as shown in your system, is host to multiple brands in the camera accessory category you should be familiar with. Ceramonic, Nanlite, Benro, Mi Photo, and Tenba, all under one roof. We're now comprised of over 20 popular brands in the photo video industry, in mics, lights, tripods, bags, and more. Ceramonic is one of the most popular and recognizable brands we have with Ceremonic, we focus on content creators and content creation, whether that be video, podcasting, streaming, music, or even just telecommuting for work or school with our home base kits. Our newest and most popular product is our Blink 500 Pro digital mini wireless system.
Thanks for stopping by and have a great show.
Hi, welcome back. Robert Trawick here, coming to you live from Bedford Photo Expo Live. I'm sorry if I seem a little messed up, but I got Ryan Brown in my ear, so I'm hearing like a repeat of myself every time I talk, so it's a little odd. But I just want to let you guys know that on the codes, you can put a code in every hour. And if you remember the last two codes, we had Westcott, Canon, and I'm going to give you the third one right now, and it's Photocon. Be sure to go to bedfords.com to show, to show. Wow, hang on, I'll pull this out. Be sure to go over to bedfords.com. Oh, I got to hold this up. Okay, perfect. So be sure to go to bedfords.com and sign up for Photocon the last weekend in October. So the word for or the code for this hour is Photocon. The last two was Canon and Westcott. You can only use those codes one per hour, but if you write them down, because you're going back and you probably should go back and review the video to get those other codes, because it increases your chance to win all the great prizes. So let's go for our notes, just to make sure I don't miss anything. So coming up at 7 p.m., we have our keynote speaker, Joel Grimes, Explorer of Light. You don't wanna miss that. But right now we have Ryan Brown coming up, techniques for epic landscape photography. So Ryan Brown is a photographer in Kansas City, Missouri area. Hello everybody from Kansas City. And uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in science of photography from Central Missouri, Missouri State. In addition to being a certified professional photographer, Ryan has earned a degree of master of photography, master artist, and photographic craftsman. He's earned numerous awards for his work as well as exhibits all over the country. For the past two years, he has been working closely with Canon USA in addition to creating his personal images and his great landscape photography. So here's Ryan. It's going to be amazing. Enjoy the program, and I will check with you guys shortly. Ryan, take it away. Hello. It's good to see everybody. Well, hear everybody, possibly. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, and they're going to be answering those later. I'm Ryan Brown. We're going to talk about landscape photography. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, different things, settings, a variety of things start to finish. Uh, over the end, I'll go over some of the equipment that I use and uh, different filters, that kind of thing. So again, if you have any questions, you just uh, we'll talk to you about them at the end. Uh, here we go. So first of all, Canon put out something called the Webcam Utility, and right now I'm coming to you on the EOS R with the RF 50 millimeter lens through the webcam utility. So that's being used as a webcam right now. So uh, that's why I can see that the high quality shines on my forehead. And this is a free download if you have a camera. Uh, most new cameras are um, able to, to run on this. Some of the older ones here and there, you just have to check the website for it. So what we're gonna cover today, we're gonna talk about lens choice. We're gonna talk about different cameras, uh, the settings. Uh, what settings are going to make the best landscape images and other images as well, not necessarily just landscapes or cityscapes. Uh, we'll talk about filters. We'll talk about the time of day we want to shoot, composition. We're going to get into some black and white, just a variety of different things. So first of all, with lens choice, we're going to go with that first. So if you've probably seen that most people are going to tell you to use a wide angle lens for landscapes. Is that right? Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on what you want. It's a creative choice. So wide angle is a popular choice for landscapes. And what is a wide angle? We're gonna talk about that in a second. And a normal lens, a telephoto lens, and tilt shift lenses. So one of the first things we need to know is what camera do we have? And um, I'm assuming that you're probably, at this point, you're probably getting into full frame cameras. You might still have a Rebel camera, something with a smaller sensor. So what this guy that's up on the screen right now shows is the different sensor sizes. Um, and what the sensor is, is that's that little piece in the camera that captures the film. That's one of the most important pieces uh, of your the camera. And so what this is going to do, this shows you that a full frame, that FF right there in the upper left-hand corner, that's a full frame sensor. It's 24 by 36 millimeters. And that is the same size, the 35 millimeter negative. So if you're a film shooter, that film would have been 24 by 36 millimeters for the negative size. And then we'll see different sizes of APS-C. So if you have the Canon 90D, uh, you have a 70, something like that, you're going to be in that red line. That's your sensor size. Then there's micro four thirds. So what I'm not covering is, uh, I'm not going to only cover Canon. I'm going to tell you some techniques about something that you might have if you're not a Canon shooter. 
Um, so that's why Nikon in there in Micro Four Thirds, which is your Panasonic and Olympus. So on the right, what I'm showing here is uh, full frame is what the normal lens size is. And what this means is that if you take these rectangles on the left and you measure the diagonal from corner to corner, uh, that diagonal measurement's about 43.3. That's technically, that is your normal lens size. So why that's important is because when we say a normal lens or we say a wide angle, it's not the same on every camera. It's not the same on your R5 and R6 as it would be on an M50 or a 90D. So when we go down to your APS-C cameras, your normal lens size is gonna be about 30 millimeters because that diagonal between the corners is closer to about 27 millimeters. So anything below that, what this means is that if you hold up with a full frame camera, a 50 millimeter lens, put it up to your eye, take it away, everything you see is about the same size. And why this is important, this is also the separation of wide angle and telephoto. So on a full frame SLR, your separation is gonna be at about 50 millimeters going to wide angle, the telephoto, and on your APS-C cameras, so your smaller sensor cameras, it's about 30 millimeters. So if you are a landscape shooter, full frame is going to give you more options for those wide angle lenses. It's going to help you out um, just to give you more choices that are available. APS-C, there's still other um, options you can do with Canon. You have a 10 to 18. Uh, with the M-series cameras, you have 11 to 22. So there are options for you to get APS-C wide angle lenses to do that landscape work. Um, if you're a sports shooter, then you're probably going to be better off with an APS-C. So it's going to give you um, more options for telephotos than less expense. So uh, that's why this is important. Why we're going over it is because we need to know where our wide angle lenses begin and where telephoto begins. So here's an image from a wide angle lens. You can see that if you're looking at this with the, your eye, um, it's going to look wider. It's not going to look necessarily how you saw it. It's going to look wider. So this is going to be um, around a 24 millimeters. So with wide angle lenses, uh, Canon makes a 15 to 35 RF and a 16 to 35. Um, most uh, companies are gonna make something around a 16 or a 17 to 35. For my personal work, I like to stay around that 24. I believe um, for my own uh, creative look, I, do, I think the wide angle, the 15 is a little bit too wide, the 16 is a little bit too wide. For me, I prefer to stay around that 24 to start. So a normal lens. So they call this uh, a nifty 50, they call it an artist lens, whatever you wanna call it. But what it is, uh, it's just a single lens. It's a prime lens. And what you mean by prime lens is it's a single focal length. Uh, if you wanna zoom it, you have to walk in or walk out or zoom it with your feet. So it's a little bit tougher to get creative with this lens. You have to think about your image more. You have to walk in, find your composition and walk towards your composition rather than just zooming the lens to find your composition. So 50 millimeter lens, it can be done. You can do whatever you want to with this. You can do landscapes like this. You just have to be more selective and more creative of how you get the composition. Telephoto, this was done with the 70 to 200 lens. Uh, 70 to 200, it, this one, I believe is about 100 millimeter, maybe a little bit over 100 millimeter. Um, you can do a landscape with this. One thing I do like to do with telephoto and doing landscapes, it's a good way to create a pano uh, or panoramic image and stitch it together. Uh, so we can do, you know, verticals or horizontal and do four or five and just pan your, your camera when you shoot and you can get these uh, wide angle images and st or, uh, sorry, telephoto images and stitch it together to make a long wide angle panoramic image. So telephoto, again, you can do this. It's not uh, a huge landscape lens, but there are a lot of great images you can do with uh, telephoto lens. All you have to do is get out and be creative and look for it. So some of the settings that we need to look at are your basic ones, ISO, f-stop, shutter speed. And another one here is the hyperfocal distance. And we'll talk about that a couple of times today here in landscapes and later on and when we get to some night stuff. So here are the charts. Um, and some of these charts I borrowed from other sources. So uh, all the images are mine. Some of the charts uh, are come from different places, just so you know. So the aperture here, uh, what this is showing you is that you have your F2 up to 22 and there's other you know, things that you can get above 22. There's some lenses that'll let you have some other options. Some lenses let you have uh, lower than an F2. You can get 1.4 lenses, you can get 1.2 lenses. Uh, so there's other options. So when you go down on your F-stop, it's gonna give you 
a uh, more of a background blur. So generally with the landscape image, you're gonna be up in that F11, 16 or 22 range, which is gonna give you more depth of field from your foreground to your background. Uh, shutter speed, how this is going to affect your landscape image is when you uh, are holding your camera and your lens, do you want to have a faster shutter speed? And what I generally say is that for the rule of sharpness, do you want to have your shutter speed equal to the focal length of your lens for a stationary subject? And what that means is if you have a 50 millimeter lens, I would shoot it around a 60th of a second for a subject that's not moving. A landscape, uh, a 60th of a second will work fine. Most of the time you're going to be on a tripod. Um, that will work just fine. I don't like to push it too much and go too much lower on a handheld shutter speed. Uh, if you have a moving subject, if you're taking a picture of birds in flight, uh, you're gonna have to up your shutter speed even more. And then if you have a high, uh, like an R5, which a high uh, resolution camera, they call it high pixel density. So when you have something like that, you want to double your shutter speed for a stationary subject and go even faster for something that's moving. For ISO, um, what you want to do generally is stay around to 100. It's, again, you're going to be on a tripod. You can stay at 100 or the lowest possible ISO you can get a good image out of. Uh, you can go up higher than that. It's going to create grain. And where that comes into being a problem uh, is if you're doing some lower light things or doing stuff with stars, those pixels and that noise start to look like stars. So to get the cleanest image, I would do a lower ISO. So here's the chart about your aperture and f-stop. So uh, a lot of people use your aperture and f-stop interchangeably and they're not the same thing. Uh, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the diaphragm, which are the blades here. We're looking at the opening, which is the aperture. And then we're looking at the f-stop, which is uh, the measurement uh, of the opening. It's also a ratio between the lens and the focal length. So your f-stop is the opening, your blades are the aperture, and the aperture is the actual, or the, the blades are, the diaphragm, and then the opening is the aperture. So we have a measurement. There's three different things here. Um, so we want to be around an F16. So you can see that that's that real small opening that's going to create the best depth of field, the most depth of field, uh, until you go up to like a 22. Some lenses have a 27. Some lenses even have a 32. So the higher you go, uh, you're going to get a more depth of field. Um, and there are some exceptions to this. Yeah, we won't talk about it now, but there are some exceptions to this where you may have to back off like if you go to a 32, maybe I'll back off one stop and go to a 22 uh, just to get more depth of field. And then if you're shooting a portrait, then you would be down in that bottom row around that 2, 2.8 and F4 where it will blur your background out. But for us and for this purpose today, we're going to be on the top row around the F8, 11, 16. ISO, this is what we're talking about with the noise, that grain, that's your sensitivity. Uh, the higher the ISO, the more sensitivity is the light. Uh, so you're seeing the noise, you're seeing the grain in the image, the actual pixels. So uh, the ISO 100 is gonna be cleaner. Uh, the higher you go, it's gonna get to be noisier. With today's cameras and today's technology, 3200 is still a very usable image. It's not as grainy as what we see here. Uh, this is really enhanced just to show what the ISO is gonna do. Uh, you can get up to um, 3200, 6400, even 10,000 ISO for some cameras for today and have a decently clean image. So hyperfocal distance is something else we want to talk about. And hyperfocal distance is how we're going to focus the image between the combination of your f-stop, your focal length, um, to get the most depth of field out of our um, setup. And you can see here that if you focus at the top of you to that focus point, it's going to be out of focus in the background. If you focus too close, the foreground will be out of focus. And the hyperfocal distance is the exact right point to focus at, the right distance to create the foreground and the background and focus. And where this really comes into play is when you're doing night work to, to get the most up the field because you can't necessarily see anything to autofocus off of. So we need to measure it to, um, on our lens to where the uh, distance scale is to put it at the right depth uh, for the right focus. So we can use this also in landscapes to get yeah, like they, here, they show a cactus in the foreground, a mountain in the background. The hyperfocal distance is going to get you in the right place. And there's places that we can go to get a hyperfocal calculator uh, to find what we need there. And we'll talk about the hyperfocal calculator here later on. So here's an image from uh, outside of Las Vegas. And this is showing uh, a hyperfocal distance. Basically, you can see that the foreground, the middle ground, the background, everything's in focus here. And this is in an F22. 
uh, every piece of this is in focus. Uh, and this is where it comes into play. This is going to be a little bit wider ant lens, uh, somewhere between it, I believe is about a 35. So it's not too wide. It's not too long. Uh, 35 is one of my favorite lenses or focal lengths for a lot of different uses, um, even for landscapes. It's just uh, just enough to get it a little bit wider than that normal lens, enough where it gives you a little bit more uh, in your image. Okay, again, this is a uh, wider angle lens. This is with uh, this was actually shot with the Canon 5DSR. It was a 50 megapixel camera that was just discontinued last year, uh, September 11th. So this is almost. Uh, probably about four years ago, I believe, when this was photographed. Uh, and then this is a longer exposure image. You can tell because the water is smooth. But we also have, uh, we, we looked at the, the hyperfocal distance here. And I have the foreground, the background, the middle ground. It's all in focus. You can see that the windows are sharp. The pilings are sharp in the, in the front. Um, so if that was not, if that was going to be out of focus, those pilings were, it would be a real distraction in our image. So we really need to uh, use our hyper focal distance and our settings at f22 somewhere in that area to get the most up the field out of this image. So let's talk about shutter speed. So some of the things we can do, this is a little bit enhanced. This is panning, it's showing you uh, if we use this lower shutter speed and we move the camera with whatever we're photographing, we can create some artistic looks here. Uh, a lot of times I like to do this with waves and we can create, <clears throat> excuse me, the, with the rolling uh, of the ocean, we can move with it and create a, a neat look. So this is gonna be a slower shutter speed uh, and you can do a faster shutter speed. You just have to move the camera a little bit faster, but we wanna do something slower than what that uh, focal length is of the lens. So again, if it's a 50 millimeter at this point, we'd be probably a 25th of a second or a, a 10th of a second, just something a little, a little bit slower. So another place we would use the slow shutter speed in a landscape image is to get that cotton candy water look, get the slow moving water. Uh, it's an image a lot of people like to create. And it really depends on a couple of things. One, our shutter speed, and two, how fast the water is moving. Is it churned up? Is it creating some white fluffy look with the rocks that are there? How fast is the water moving? Um, when we look at all those, we can see that if we have white, if we have the churned up, the soapy look of the water, and it's moving, then we can do a fifth of a second <clears throat> and create uh, some movement in the water. So this gives us, um, for me and what I think, when I look at these images, I think that it creates uh, something that's less of a distraction. You don't see all the um, conflict in the water, all the movement, everything just bunching up. This creates a softer image and something that's easier to look at. So this is a slower shutter speed again. This is about a fifth of a second. And, and this is on a tripod. So this is something you would want to do on a tripod. It keeps the uh, every other part of the image sharp. Your rocks, your trees, uh, all the greenery is going to be sharp. What well, keeps the water moving? So here's another one. This is from the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, this is, uh, I believe it was Multnomah Falls. You can see here that uh, the water is moving, the rocks, everything else is staying sharp. Uh, I burnt down the edges of it just to bring a little bit more emphasis to the water. Um, but you can see it's moving. We just used a slow shutter speed for this. So this was uh, created. Uh, if any of you had gone to the big shoot here a couple of years ago, this was created there. Uh, and then this is the slow moving, again, slow moving water. The water's coming down. And you can see the spin of the water. If you're just looking at it with the eye, you don't necessarily see those leaves just turning and spinning around the circle, but this is uh, showing it when you use that slower shutter speed, you can see the movement in the water uh, and what's happening there. So a few other things that uh, I wanna look at here, time of day and the weather. Uh, what's the best time of day to shoot? You know, it just depends. It depends on what you're going for. Um, I like to shoot at sunrise and sunset. I'm one of the crazy people that if I'm out in the mountains, I'll get up before. Uh, sunrise and go out to the, find the location. So I research the location ahead of time and be out at the location at sunrise, uh, ready to go and hope that the sunrise comes up with some clouds and everything looks good. So this is from uh, Yellowstone at the north entrance. So sunrise, this is um, in southern Missouri and not too far from where um, a lot of you are. So this is Lake Tanicomo in the Branson area. 
uh, right around sunrise in the summer. You see the sun's coming up, the water's ice cold, the fog's coming up off of it. And it creates a nice reflection, um, not reflection, but color coming through the fog, gives you that nice orange sunrise glow. Uh, so sunrise can be a really nice time to shoot to give you just the dramatic landscapes that you're looking for. Sunset is another great time to shoot. With sunset, we can uh, have the sun coming down. It's gonna, we can open up the shadows in the foreground. And there's a couple of ways to do this. We talk about filters in a few minutes. Um, but the sunset, another time when that sun goes up, it uh, reflects off all the clouds, gives you your pinks and your purples and all the different colors in the sky, all those colors that create a nice dramatic landscape. Uh, and then the middle of the day, um, this is a time when I would start experimenting with some creative uses of filters, uh, start doing low and low exposures, uh, black and white images, something a little bit more dramatic because you're gonna have more contrast in the middle of the day. Uh, with that sun's up, uh, it's gonna create more shadows, more highlights, which is the contrast. And that's going to provide uh, more options for black and whites, more options for shadow use and those things. So there are things that we can do in the middle of the day. Uh, most landscape photographers would probably tell you the middle of the day is time to get breakfast and lunch and go back in the middle at, uh, at sunset. But there are things we can do in the middle of the day. Weather. So again, this is another one from Tani Como, the weather, again, the fog. I, I love weather. Um, I don't want just a blue sky. I don't want just the sun coming up with a blue sky. To me, it's boring. It's nice, but it's boring for photography. So I like to have clouds. I like to have fog. I like to have storms, snow, whatever it is, something to create that dramatic landscape. This image here is focused on this guy uh, that was doing some fishing. Unfortunately, he's not fly fishing. Uh, that would have been what I was really looking for was a fly fisherman out there that day. And you know, with your iconic fly fisherman bucket hat too, that would have been great. But uh, this worked out just fine. And then I saw from the fog, I saw these two kayakers coming through and I held off uh, until these uh, kayakers got to the right point because I wanted to have the same distance between the end of the left kayak and then the distance from the fishing rod to the other end. So it gives me just a compositional element to look for, for the right positioning. Otherwise it would look off balance and like it was heavy on one side. So I was looking for the balance to be perfect between the kayak and the fisherman. And then right in the middle, again, that's another um, area where you have the same distance. So those are just some things that you don't necessarily, you're not conscious of all the time when you look at an image, but people plan for uh, to create a more dramatic image. So another one, got another fisherman. Uh, it's just a place I really like to shoot down there. It just creates almost a silhouette. And again, more fog, snow, and the, uh, in the middle of winter where it's nice and cold, I'm not looking forward to that. I'd rather have summer still. So when the snow's out, there's still places to shoot. Uh, there's a little bit of fog this day also. You can see it in the trees. Just another time to shoot to get something a little bit more dramatic that you don't necessarily see all the time. Storms, this is an interesting image. Uh, this was in South, uh, Southwest Iowa. And this was a cornfield. I was out there doing something completely separate and these storms started coming up. And so I went out in this cornfield and started to shoot lightning. That was the main thing I was there for. The clouds separated, it gave me the option because I was at the right f-stop uh, to get the stars in the sky as well when the, uh, when the clouds started to move. And then at the right time while I was shooting, uh, the lightning bolt went and at the same time, a car came by and lit up the cornfield with the sunlight. So sometimes you get lucky as well. So you don't necessarily planning for everything. Sometimes things just line up and you get an image. Another use of uh, weather here. This is in Galveston Bay, in Galveston, Texas. So we've got the fog coming up. The fog's all over the shrimp boat. The shrimp boat's got to catch. You can tell because the birds are around it. Uh, it's coming in. And uh, I like to, on these types of images, fog is kind of gray. And we'll talk about this when we get to black and white and how exposure affects that. But fog is kind of gray. So I will do a few things to create a, uh, that gray to make it white. And that's what I've done here, uh, just to create that white. So we're not just necessarily looking at a gray image. I want that contrast. I want the white on it. So again, fog, and they did some post-production here to create the white. There's more snow. We've got some rolling hills in Montana. Snow, we've got a storm coming down over the mountain. Just something else to create that dramatic landscape. 
So let's talk about some filters. Now, this is one of my um, favorite things to do or use filters. Uh, when I shoot, I try to do everything in camera as much as possible, as much as I can in camera. Uh, I don't, I, I like using Photoshop when I have to, but I try to do as much as I can within the camera to get the image right. So I have to do less in Photoshop. So this image here was done with a variety of filters. It was done with a little post-production and all the composition was done on a tripod. So I wasn't having to go back and change the horizon and turn it. I tried to line it up in camera so everything was ready to go. So the filters we're gonna talk about are circular polarizer, the ND, which is a neutral density, and then the graduated neutral density. These are the three that I keep in my bag. And then uh, on some of these, I have different versions of them. So what a circular polarizer does, this is one that you should always have in your bag. Uh, it's gonna create a dark blue sky and it's also gonna take the reflections out of the water. So you can see here uh, with the reflections that would have been covering the water. You wouldn't have been able to see the scuba divers from the lower right side. But with the circular polarizer, when you put it on your lens, it has a ring, you turn the ring until you see the look that you like. You'll see it right inside your viewfinder. You'll see the reflections go away. You'll see the blue get darker. Uh, so those are that's a filter I would always have. And it also is good for stacking filters as well. Neutral density. Neutral density filter is nothing more than sunglasses for your lens. A uh, neutral density filter is just a piece of dark glass that goes over it that helps you create a uh, slower or a longer exposure uh, in the middle of the day or at any time, really. So when we use the ND filter, this gives me this long exposure in the middle of the day, which causes that cloud tracking you see. You see the cloud movement here. But you also see that this is a turned up ocean. It's a rough ocean, but now all the water has become just smooth and just almost foggy looking. So we can see that coming up through the rock. So that's what it's gonna do. Uh, and when you use a neutral density, um, someplace where there's no ocean, no movement in the water, you can still get the cloud tracking, which makes a, a really nice looking image. So we can get that cloud track, just depends again on uh, how fast is the clouds are moving. If your clouds are moving kind of slow, then you may have to do uh, a longer shutter speed if you can, or you may just have to, to scrap it and wait till you find a day when there is fast moving clouds. Because this is something we're just gonna be able to adjust the exposure necessarily. So the graduated neutral density filter is something that goes from dark to light. So it graduated means that it's gonna start really, really dark at the top and gradually get lighter and lighter and lighter. Um, at the bottom becomes clear. And there's two types. There is a hard graduated neutral density filter and a soft graduated neutral density filter. The hard is going to have a hard transition from dark to light, where the soft transition is going to be a softer transition where you don't necessarily see it. If you've heard of hard light and soft light, it's kind of the same thing, where your edge transition is going to be a little softer. Uh, when you use a jagged edge horizon like this image, this is where the softer would come into play, where if you have a ocean um, where it's a hard horizon line, we would just pull that down to that horizon. So here's a few images we're gonna go through with uh, how filters are being used. So this is an image uh, from Lake Tahoe. And I show this first because everybody seems to like it. It looks good. There's no problems with it. It's just a basic image where this is actually shot from a cell phone just to get a before image. So we have our, uh, this was actually sunrise, kind of funny. Um, I'd never been here before and I left Reno uh, to go out here and I only could find it by GPS coordinates. So I plugged the GPS coordinates in my phone, drove to where it said it was and waited until the sun came up just enough to where I could see I was in the right place and went out and uh, started setting up. So this is before image. And then I started adding some filters here. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna add uh, number one, I think I'm going to add a circular polarizer to this because I think I can see through the water. So I started adding a few things here to see through the water. And when you do the circular polarizer, it's still going to give you a dark tint over your lens. And when we do that, it's going to create an exposure to where now I'm exposing the foreground fine, but I have a problem up top. So now I need to start adding other things to it. So I decided now I'm going to add a graduated neutral density filter here. And okay, the exposure is pretty good, but now I can see that I pulled it down too far because I can see that my rocks in the middle are way too dark, but at the bottom they're exposed properly. So I needed to change that up and move it a little bit. 
So I moved it and brought it back up a little bit. Now I have a good exposure in the foreground, good exposure on the clouds and the sky. I can see my mountains in the background. I can see through the water. I have my long exposure, everything's good. And here's another one that shows you uh, the same type of thing. It's a before image. And you can see on the front of that lens, that is the filter holder. And you can stack them up on this. And the way it works is that I've got these long rectangular filters and they can go in vertically. And then right at the front, it has a circular polarizer, which is a round one that screws in. So I can move that and you can see um, right at the front of the lens, you can see a little bump that pops up on that ring. And that's the wheel I would move my circular polarizer with. So I have access to turn the polarizer while I'm using the filters on the front as well. And then I can start stacking these if I need to. If I really want to get a dark look, if it's really bright in the, um, in the background and really dark in the foreground, I can start stacking them up and changing the levels of them uh, and then get the exposure I'm looking for. So here's the final image that I received from this. And you can see here that everything looked pretty good. I just decided to go with a circular polarizer. I went with the graduated neutral density filter. And then I went with an uh, overall ND filter to get a super long exposure to create all that movement in the water just to get it smooth. So I've got, uh, this is the same place that I was before. Uh, so Lake Tahoe again, but I created the exposure in the foreground, exposure in the clouds, the sky, the mountains in the background. And then I've got my circular polarizer. You can see the rocks through the water. This is where these filters come into play. Another use of these. So you can see the foreground looks pretty good, but I've got this, uh, what looks like a, the mountain on fire. It's so bright there. So I started adding things to it. I added my graduated neutral density filter. And I thought, you know what, that, that looks better, but it's still a little bit bright. I think I can add to it. So I added to it again. And you can see it brought out that detail in the sky. So we'll go back through it again. So I've got the brightness in the sky and I just started adding. I thought, you know what? Let's make it a little bit darker. And you can see that the foreground doesn't change at all. Now pay attention to the foreground this time. You can see the only thing that changes is the top half of the image. Here's another one in the middle of the day. And we're talking about what do we do in the middle of the day? Well, we can shoot uh, long exposures and we can do like black and white. We can do whatever we want to. I, started watching these clouds and saw that they were tracking right at me. And I thought this might be a good image to start trying something like this. So we've got my first image and you don't realize how clear that water is until you put the circular polarizer on there. And you can see through the water, you can see on the lower right of that rock in the middle that we've got a little bit of teal look. We can see the rocks underneath the water and the water's all moving. I've got my, um, what this filter is that I'm using is a 10 stop neutral density filter. And you can't see through this filter. If you hold it up, it's just a black basic glass. You can't see through it at all. Um, and to tell you how it works, and what I would do with this, number one, if you're a 5D or a DSLR user at all, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to focus on whatever you're going to focus on, your rock, your mountain, whatever it is. And then once you focus on it, you put your lens on manual focus and screw your filter on or drop it in, however your, your filter is going to work. And then that's how you would shoot because you can't focus through the image with the DSLR. Well, this is where one of the highlights of the, the mirrorless cameras come in because with the R5 and R6 and R camera, I actually can focus through this 10 stop filter. So I can put it on and then focus on my image um, and it can still see through it, which is a big benefit of that mirrorless camera. Here's Laguna Beach, California, another image, sunrise, get up early and go out there. Um, I was out there for work one day, so got to go out and shoot a little bit while I can early in the morning. So Laguna Beach, and here it is, sunrise. So you got a little bit of tracking through the sky. You see the sun coming up over the uh, mountain on the left and movement in the water. It's a 10 stop. And these are mostly um, around three minute to four minute exposures. And there's something called reciprocity failure. And what reciprocity failure is, what reciprocity is, is if you go up on a shutter speed, you're gonna go down on your f-stop. So if you go up one, you're gonna go down on the other one, okay? So as you get a longer exposure, that doesn't necessarily work anymore. So as we get longer exposures, if I go down, say go from three minutes to three and a half minutes on exposure, 
you may very get get almost no change whatsoever in exposure. You may have to go from three minutes to four and a half minutes or three minutes to five minutes to really see a noticeable change. So that's what reciprocity failure is, is that the longer the exposure, your up one, down one doesn't work anymore. So we have to go plan and go out further and further. So these are about three to four minute exposures generally to get that kind of movement. So if you have any um, filter questions, go ahead and write those down. And we're gonna move on to night landscapes now, but uh, write those down and we'll come back to them. So night landscapes, um, this is kind of a different niche that most people don't necessarily know about. People know about Milky Way photography, uh, but they don't know about night landscapes. And what this is, uh, this image is in Yellowstone. This is at the north entrance. And we were out there, everybody was photographing the Milky Way. And the problem with the Milky Way that night was you can see on the left here, you see a cloud coming through the sky. Well, where the Milky Way was, was right above the camera and to the right of me. And there were clouds there and you couldn't see the Milky Way. So since the Milky Way was um, up in the sky, but covered, and we had a sliver of moon coming down still, um, I decided to try some night landscapes. And this entire image here is lit by the moon. And the moon gives you a daytime exposure at night and a daytime look at night, Not sorry, not daytime exposure, a daytime look at night because creating the highlights and the shadows for everything, but you can still see the stars in the sky. It's shot at a higher ISO, uh, and that's why you get a little bit noisier look here, but that is something to where um, you're going to get a, a daytime look at night. So settings and um, tips for Milky Way. If you are going to go out and photograph Milky Way, uh, there are some different things that can help you here. And one is generally you're going to have lower than a 30 second exposure. And the reason for this is that more than 30 seconds, you're going to start to see trails in the sky uh, with the stars. And so you can do star trails. People like doing star trails. It's a little bit different now than it was with film. But if you don't want the star trails that you want to keep it around 30 seconds or less so you don't get those movement, uh, that movement in the stars. Uh, you want the lowest possible ISO because higher ISOs introduce noise or grain into your image. And which looks like when you're post, uh, doing post-production Photoshop, that grain starts to look like your stars. And then you start looking at it thinking, I don't know what's a star and what's not. So when I try and get the lowest possible ISO. Uh, next thing is a wide, fast lens. So we want 24 millimeter at 1.4 if we can, um, or a, a 16 millimeter, 2.8, whatever it is. So you want a wide lens that's fast because the Milky Way is huge and the wider lens that we can get, we get more of it in. And then the faster the lens we use, the lower the ISO we can use because it opens up and lets in more light. Then we're gonna bring in the hyperfocal distance. And the hyperfocal distance, again, is going to let you get the most focus here between this Joshua tree and the background and get everything in focus. And then this photo pills that we're going to talk about in just a second as well. So this is the hyperfocal distance. Um, and then there's a calculator in this app we're going to talk about. But basically what this is, is that we'll look at the bottom one on a full frame camera. If we're using a 24 millimeter lens, and yeah, we're going to shoot it at f11 then our uh, lens needs to be focused to 5.7 feet. So there's a distance scale on top of your lens and you can see it when you put it in manual focus, it's gonna go to little figure eight, which is infinity, down to the minimum focusing distance. So we wanna put it on 5.7 feet. But when you look at that lens, what you're gonna notice is that those aren't necessarily marked. You're not gonna find 5.7 feet. So a lot of this is gonna be trial and error where you have to shoot at what you think is 5.7 feet and then adjust from there. Look at it, is it in focus, is it not? Then we may have to tweak it just a little bit here and there to get the right hyperfocal distance. But it gives you a basic starting point. So if you have any question on that, we can cover that as well later. And then APS-C cameras, you can see the same kind of thing. Um, I use this app called, Hyper, uh, called Photo Pills, and it's about, I believe it's $10, and the hyperfocal uh, calculator is on there to where it's a little chart where you can cite it saying, I'm using 12 millimeters or 24 millimeters, whatever it is, and I'm using this f-stop, tell me what to focus on, and it'll tell you what to focus on. Uh, another benefit of this is that it has something called a moon rise and a moon set calendar in it as well, and we have all know about a sunrise and sunset calendar. Well, with night photography, especially with the Milky Way, you need to be concerned with the moon rise and moon set. 
because when the moon comes up, you're not going to be able to shoot the Milky Way. You need to shoot it between the moon set and moon rise because that's the darkest time of night. And when you shoot it then, that gives you the brightest stars in the Milky Way and the best settings are allowed to be able to see all that. So the hyperfocal calculator is an important part of this. Something else in it is that it has the augmented reality for night or the Milky Way to where you can hold your phone up in the sky. It shows you exactly where that Milky Way is going to be. It shows you the same thing with the moon. It shows you the same thing with the sun. So whether you're portrait photographer, night photographer, landscape shooter, whatever it is, for 10 bucks, there's a lot of benefits in this program. Is that for you? Oh, just something else I didn't mention here. Um, since these are very long exposures, you don't have to use much light. This Joshua tree was lit up by a cell phone. And that's all we needed was just a cell phone. Just to light that up just a little bit, you just tap it. Uh, if you're using a flashlight, you just tap it real quick and then that will give you just enough light. So this was shot in, uh, in my backyard. And this is an old tractor. And what I did here is we had the Milky Way. There wasn't a lot of Milky Way. There's some light pollution that night, but this was one where we got the Milky Way. And then I went and I did some painting, uh, light painting on that tractor with the flashlight just to give it a little bit of a highlight. So you can mix your light sources here. And, but you just have to be quick with it because you can't put too much light in an image like this for the Milky Way. Another one lit up by cell phone. You've got some night stuff. You've got the Milky Way, again, not too bright back there. Uh, but then the Joshua trees are lit up by a cell phone. And you can see that uh, everything is sharp from the foreground to the background. Again, started with the hyperfocal distance calculator and figured out where I should be focused at and then started focusing to that. And it's not going to be right on. You're going to have to do some trial and error in that. If you're doing a lot of this, uh, then I would probably tape your lens to tell you exactly where to put it. Another night landscape, and this is again, one that was lit up by the moon. Uh, and with this, uh, this is about 11 o'clock at night at Snake River Overlook in the Tetons. And the moon was to my left. And I uh, exposed it for that as a higher ISO. And when I exposed it for the moon, then that let me get all the stars in the sky, the night exposure or the, the daytime look at the night exposure. Uh, and a couple of ways you can do this. One, if you want to have more stars in the sky with the same look, you could find a night when there's less moon, like your quarter moon. If you want to have fewer stars in the sky, you could do a half moon because that's gonna create a, um, a faster exposure where the quarter moon is less light, it creates a longer exposure and creates, it gives you more stars in the sky. And you can see if, um, I don't know if that's a plane or a satellite there, it looks like a dotted line, uh, but there's some of those things you just can't help. Uh, we talked about this one, night landscape again. Moon coming from the left, it's, you know, creating the main light source for the whole image. Uh, everybody was focused on the Milky Way, and I tried something just a little bit different so we could see all those stars. So let's talk about some compositional things as well, because those are things to look for. Um, the more that you look for through your camera, the less you're going to have to fix in Photoshop. And I'm a fan, again, of doing things right in the camera and not fixing it in Photoshop. So this is the rule of thirds. Um, for the most part, uh, if you try and keep things at the rule of thirds, off at a third, so you've got your uh, tic-tac-toe board here. And if you think, uh, keep something at one of the squares, keep horizons off um, at one of those lines, it's gonna give you a stronger image generally. And there's always times and places to break these rules, but this is for most of the time. Once you know the rules and you can break the rules, uh, an S curve. So this the mountain scene. You can see that there's an S going through there. So S curves and C curves create a strong image. Any triangles. You can see the way this is broken up also creates triangles. One on the left, one on the right. Actually, a few on the right. So those triangles are going to create a strong composition as well. And then you can see that the horizon is put off at the top third of the image. Uh, so this kind of thing just draws you right into the image. You can see here. This is one that. Um, was also at the rule of thirds. You can see that that bottom row of sticks there would have been at the bottom third and the geese are at the top third. So, uh, and also you can see I photographed this again to where 
the distance in the bird on the left is equal to the distance from the stick to the right. So that creates that balance in the image without it being heavy towards one side. So we talked about this one earlier as well. This is also Lake Tahoe. This is one that was somewhat broken on that rule of thirds where the horizon the bottom third, but it's really a central composition to where you don't generally do that. You don't generally put something right in the middle, but it is right in the middle, but at the lower third. So C curves going through this one. It comes from the left on the bottom, draws you right into that uh, tree with the rock uh, in the middle. The rise is a little bit through the center, but it's not too much. I could have gone down just a little bit. I would probably change it a little bit if I was going to do it again uh, and try and do the horizon a little bit higher. So again, this one is going to be fog. It's going to have some triangles in it. Uh, you can see the, the foggy trees in the background creates a triangle from the left to the right, back to the left. And then we have our trees that draw us in. We've got the darkest one right in the, in the front. Uh, it has the most silhouette. Uh, so these things here, just the line, shape, design of it. And that's what we look for in an image is to create the composition. But it's not just all going to be about settings. It's going to be about the artistic look composition as well. So another third, this is uh, Glacier National Park. So we've got our um, rocks in the foreground. We've got our mountains in the background. We have two lines from them. It creates that rule of thirds. And then we have the rocks in the foreground, the little rocks that create framing. And framing is another compositional element. It keeps you in the image and it frames your subject for you. And that lets your eye just not roll off the bottom of the image. Uh, we've got our river here that draws you into the image. Another compositional element is called leading lines. And this line draws you into the image. Um, we read from left to right. So most of the time you want your leading line to come from the left and go to the right. But this is just one where I broke it because that's what was there. And I thought the image worked out pretty well. Uh, something else you can do, you can see that the sun right on the left there has some rays sticking out. And the way this works is that if you have a point light source and you're around an F16 or 22, the point light source can star out. It can create a star uh, as long as you have that point light source and a higher F stop. So that's something to try. Test it out sometime, Christmas lights, um, on a cityscape, whatever it is. Get your small point light source, you use a higher f-stop, you can see the star effect from it. Uh, this is in St. Croix. You can see our leaning lines from the bottom left coming up through, and it goes around the horizons at the top third of the image. This is the 10th stop uh, filter again, and with the 10th stop, you can see the clouds are being dragged out from left to right. Uh, so we've got that movement in the image. And then this also used a graduated neutral density filter to get that uh, the sky a little bit darker. This one here is uh, in Rockport, Texas. So I've got one central element to it. That's it. There's two elements. There's the pier and there's the horizon line. We've got the clouds going through it. It's sunset. 10 stop filter is three and a half minute exposure. Created all the smoothness in the water. This is the choppy Gulf of Mexico. So the Gulf was just stirred up and it created a nice uh, peaceful image out of it just by taking the 10 stop filter and making a real long exposure out of it. And then the sun and the sky, not the sun, but the sky, all that daylight was just reflecting off the water and the pier and created this nice overall pink look. So we've seen this one uh, once before now. And so this is also again, compositional elements. So we talked about this one. Uh, and now we're going to move on to some black and white stuff, because this is one of my favorite things to do is black and white images. And um, here, again, the 10 stop filter creates the long exposure. We have our triangles here. We have our leading lines, almost a Z pattern look through it. So um, what I want to talk about is the way that exposure is done in your camera, because your exposure, your camera doesn't care about black and it doesn't care about white. All it cares about is gray. So when it meters off of something, if you're doing a manual exposure and you're looking at your light meter and your camera, uh, it wants a black to be gray and it wants white to be gray, which means that if I take a picture of something, a wedding dress, if I'm going to go out and photograph a wedding and I want to do a wedding dress, it's going to say, you know what, that's too bright. I'm going to stop it down to make it gray. So if you go with the settings that the camera gives you, if it meters off that white, it's going to make it dark. It's going to be underexposed. Where if I do that with black, if I meter off of something black, it's going to say, this is too dark. I got to make this gray. So it's going to brighten it up. It's going to give you the exposure and settings to make it brighter. 
So this is important to know when you do your black and white because earlier it's talking about one of the images with the fog in it. I wanted to make that white. I didn't want it gray. So I had to go through and I had to overexpose it based on the settings it gave me. I had to overexpose it to make that white so it didn't come out gray. And if you have any question on that, write it down and we'll answer it in a few minutes. So zone system is something that um, you probably heard of Ansel Adams and Ansel was known for the zone system, but back then it was film. And what he had done was he did a conversation, uh, combination of um, exposure, development times, um, a lot of different things with dodging and burning and the dark rooms, all these different things to make what he called zones. And you can see that in this image that you have the white moon, we've got the darkness in the sky. It's not just uh, gray. It's we've got pure white, we have pure black, we have everything in between. So the way this works is you've got 10 zones, but only a few that really matter. So you've got zone three through seven here, and these are the ones that matter. So when you look at your black and white, you look at your images and you're trying to find, uh, create a black and white image, you wanna look for these tones in your image and have them heavily uh, from three through seven like this, because these are the last two with detail. Three is the darkest dark you can get with detail and seven is the brightest bright you can get with detail. So everything in between there is gonna create your black and white image. So we want pure white, we want pure black. We don't just want shades of gray because it just doesn't look contrasty enough. So this is something that'll help you with exposure as well. And you can see that zone five is a neutral gray. That's your 18% gray. Your camera wants to uh, meter everything to that 18% gray like we had just talked about. So these colors right in this line with zone five are, if you're out and you're looking, it says we're seeing in color, if we're out and we see these colors, we can meter off of and know that that's gonna give you a neutral exposure. Green grass is one of those. If you have a bright green grass, not August grass where everything looks dead right now, but bright green grass, that's gonna give you a neutral exposure. So you can meter off that with your camera. So we'll look at some black and white images here. So you can see that I've got my pure blacks, I have my pure whites, I've got my sky, uh, and I dodge and burn here also in Photoshop. So um, if you're not using Photoshop, that's something that uh, if you wanna ask me a question about it, we can talk about it, but I'll go with the highlights and I'll dodge those out to make the highlights a little bit brighter. And the shadows, when we burn the shadows, that means to make them darker. So if something looks not contrasty enough to me, I can use the dodging and burning features to be able to make those darker and lighter and create that zone system look. Another um, snake row overlook, Tetons, and this was with 10 stop filter. I've got my clouds tracking towards me. And then I will go through again and uh, highlight these the cloud highlights here. I'm gonna dodge those out, make them just a little bit brighter, dodge out the highlights in the mountains, make them brighter. Uh, the water, places that I really wanna emphasize, I can make those brighter or darker and just Give them that little bit of pop and contrast. It's the Valley of Fire outside of Las Vegas, a dried up river. I went through and I dodged out that river, uh, dodged out some of the highlights in the mountains there, the rock formations, burnt down the clouds, make it a little bit darker. And then I had this full range of tones. So this is uh, back in California. This is a long exposure. Uh, this is something that was just a little experimental, and that was because uh, there's birds in the image. You don't normally do um, a 10 stop filter, a three minute exposure, and have the birds still be there. They're generally moving, and when you have a moving subject, it just goes away. Well, this was a 10 stop exposure, 10 stop filter with a three minute exposure where the birds actually stay there and have a ghost look to them. So I went through on this water that's uh, in the highlights that are that white part of the rock there and dodged those out, went on the right side, those shadows and darkened those down. And then I um, brightened up the water just a little bit in the foreground as well. And you can see that we have pure white and pure black, everything in between. Some aspen trees in the middle of evergreen trees in Montana. And uh, these, when they're yellow, when they turn yellow in the fall, they create a nice uh, white look. So it gives you a nice lighter tone. And it gives you that good contrast separation between your shadows uh, and the, the tones of the, the evergreen trees there. So I dodged those out just a little bit, but didn't really have to all that much on these because it was a pretty good tonality the way that it was. Zion National Park, dodged out some of the, the mountains there. Also the pass, the rocks in the foreground, we've got that nice leading line drawing you right into the mountains. 
Um, and then the clouds darken those down just a little bit. So we have a nice tonality image there. So this one, um, you know, somebody, I put this in the competition once and uh, it failed miserably. And they said that it was because that it can't be done. They said that this image cannot be taken. You cannot have the moon be that bright at night while seeing the clouds. And it wasn't, as everybody thinks now that it was done digitally and you put it in there. Well, it's a circular polarizer. When I have the circular polarizer and I make that sky as dark blue as I possibly can and turn it black and white, well, now I have the black sky because of the dark blue and I have the white clouds because they were white. And then I just dodged out the moon just a little bit just to brighten it up. So I had the exposure on the moon with all the highlights and shadows there and the clouds and the dark sky all done in camera. All I did was transit to uh, black and white. Um, this is actually in Virginia. I didn't know they had the cypress trees there until we went there, but this is a uh, one. There's a lot of contrast to it. I dodged out the reflections in the water uh, where the, the trees were to brighten those up just a little bit. It didn't require a whole lot. There was a lot of contrast to it as it was. All I did was change my exposures to make sure that I had my whites white. And that was it. So another one from Yellowstone, I've got all those clouds in the sky. I went through on these highlights and the, right through the middle of the image, just brighten those up a little bit. You can see that my shadows all have detail on the left side. I've got pure black on the right side and in the foreground, I've got that river going right through the middle and dodged out some of the highlights in that and it kept my, my detail. So the last thing I wanna talk about are some of the equipment I use. So the Canon R5, R6 and R cameras, mostly the R5 for landscapes, R6 for almost everything else right now. Gara 15 to 35, the 24 to 70, 70 to 200. My two main lenses, the R15 to 35, I carry as well. I use Nisi filters, a 3.5 and a 10 stop neutral density. And then I use a graduated neutral density. I use a few other um, Nisi of those as well. Circular polarizer from, um, I believe it's Benro. And then I also use a variable uh, ND filter. And a variable ND filter is similar to a circular polarizer and that it can be, um, I believe that one is uh, two through seven stops. So the more you turn it, the darker that it gets. You just can't go all the way because it'll create like an X pattern through the image. Um, so you can go, you know, till about five or six stops and be okay. So I use a variable ND as well. I use a Pro Media Gear carbon fiber tripod and then I print on the Canon Pro 1000 when I want to print something. I print quite a bit right now. Um, so an image isn't really finished until it's printed out. So it's nothing better than seeing your image come out of the printer. So that's my contact information. If you have any questions for me, you can find me on social media there. Uh, you can find my images there. Uh, my website is ryanbrownphoto.com. Um, again, I work for Canon as well. I've been with Canon for about four years now, uh, actually three and a half years now, uh, district sales rep in the Midwest. And if there's anything you need for Canon, make sure you get with Bedford, find what uh, what you need from them. And if they need it, they'll get it from me. So uh, we're ready to answer some questions. Hang on just a second. We're pulling up the questions. Any questions? Ryan, can, you, can you hear us? All right, Ryan, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Sean, are you able to hear him? 
Sorry, slight technical difficulty. <laughs> Ryan, can you, you guys? Me? Yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. I can hear him. <laughs> you can hear him. I can hear him through the stream. Yep. Sean, you want to feed me the questions? Can Ryan hear you? Yeah, he can hear me. You can hear me right, Ryan. Yep. yep. He's nodding you. his head. <laughs> I got you. All right. All right, we're going to do this a little bit differently. <laughs> okay, so. So, Ryan, do you know anything about Canon's photo stitch that used to be available to Canon users? And is that, that program still available? Photo stitch? So you said photo stitch? You said photo stitch? Yes. Yes. No, um, I used the photo merge in Photoshop. It works pretty well. I used Photoshop, uh, Photoshop uh, the photo merge, and it worked well. Um, so another question is, um, do you do many wide panoramas? And if so, can you briefly talk about uh, hyper uh, how hyperfocal distance would affect them. So if I'm going to do, I, I do stitch panos together. And when I do that, um, I have the same exposure. So I'm not going to change it. Once I focus it, I'll put it on manual focus, use it about F11 and use the same exposure, focus everything throughout the pano that I'm going to use. Otherwise, if I start messing with things, they don't line up and they don't merge right in Photoshop. Right to the next question. Yep. Okay. So, do you shoot in a black and white uh, or color and con and then convert it? I will. Uh, okay, that's a two-part answer. So, I will shoot in color and convert it for landscapes. Um, if I shoot in raw, then it's going to show me black and white, but it's always going to come back in color. Uh, but if I'm going to shoot street photography, if I'm going to go out and shoot like the M6 Mark II, I always shoot that in raw, but in black and white, because I know I'm going to shoot it in black and white or create it in black and white. So I'll shoot the black and white, knowing that I'm actually taking a raw image. But for landscapes, it's always going to be color. That makes sense. Ryan, I think that's all the questions we've got. Okay. Definitely uh, appreciate you um, joining us here for this. Uh, it was an awesome presentation. Oh, one more question. Let's see. Um, yeah. Night landscapes. Uh, let's see. Are you using any neutral density filters? No, because it's already dark and I don't need to. Um, it's about getting the exposure right. So your shutter speed and your f-stop right. Um, so there, yeah, there's really no reason to use a neutral density filter at that point because you know, the purpose of the neutral density filter is to make your exposure longer, make it for daytime. Uh, when you can't necessarily get the long exposure, it gives you that ability. So you already have that ability at night because it's already darker. 